right, there's uh, me and Max Mikes. Uh, we are live and coming at ya. Mac is still uh, doing some setup stuff here, so I'm gonna go live as me here. Hello, everyone. Hello, Alistair. Thanks for the sub there, Berdan. Before we even started, awesome. Look at that, 15 months. That's freaking great. Let's get like 5 million of those over the next year, right? <laughs> So uh, there is a lot of fun stuff to talk about uh, today, uh, but you know what we're going to do first? We are going to test uh, something. Let's see. Oh, look. It works. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, oh, it replies to you with that one. That's cool. Okay, that works. Um, what was the uh, third one? Hmm. I don't remember. Uh, you you hear talking? What was the uh, third one that you set up? Uh, I don't have Discord up on my screen at this point. Uh, you can test that one. Oh, we know that Stream Elements can actually post links and Auto Mod doesn't remove them, which was the thing we were trying to figure out. Uh, so some of the setup is uh, coming together here. Uh, you will notice we have uh, moved a few things around in the background. If you were watching uh, last week, uh, trying to get camera setups going here, we got. Um, Max camera moved around a little, so it doesn't have all the bright lights that we have to uh, block out with uh, with a green screen uh, in place here. And um, yeah, I think we are just uh, ready to get going here. Oh, uh, thanks for the uh, thanks for the follow there, Alpin Rebel. Uh, we have figured out that um, we have to uh, restart <clears throat> the windows with stream elements in it in order for these uh, alerts to show up. As you might remember a couple weeks ago when we were fighting with them, I literally have to log out and log back in and refresh that window uh, or they don't happen. So now we know. Um, we It wasn't the restarting of OBS that did it last week like we thought. It's actually the window. So uh, the, the uh, Firefox window with stream elements open. I don't know why that does it. Uh, you tell me. But um, literally, if I don't have the thing up, it doesn't work. So yeah, here we are. It's working now. Uh, I'm going to start a couple more things in the background here. There we go. Bitrate looks good. All right. Good evening, everybody. Um, how is it going? Uh, getting people to join. I posted all the socials there, posted in the Discord. So glad everyone is here. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mac, are you ready to come on stream? I am. All right. <clears throat> let's do the uh, the button. And there we are, both of us. Look at that. <laughs> We both kind of have a similar background, although yeah, you can see the masks in yours. That's uh, when yeah. I look over there. That's because I'm 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 looking up at the uh, preview of what's going out on the on the stream. Because if I look over here, I'm seeing the one that's like five seconds behind, and it really messes with me. Uh, I have I just have no idea how that to figure that one out. Rough. Oh my god, it's killing me. Uh, yeah, hydrating early here. Mm -hmm. So uh, update for the people who uh, care about some of the personal stuff. Um, my uh, surgery was scheduled for March 28th. They said at the doctor um, for my deviated septum that is now basically closed off my nose uh, that, um, yes, <laughs> uh, that uh, I need to have surgery immediately. Um, and by immediately, when I went to the scheduler's desk, uh, the first we can see you is March 28th. So that was, uh, that, that sure is immediate. Uh, but they said they'd call me if there were any cancellations. And luckily, today I was called and told that December 27th. So I will be having surgery that week. Uh, yes, and as for the hot girl in the background, uh, that was my wife bringing me dinner. And she flipped me off. No, that was chat saying that, thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so my surgery for all that stuff is going to be that week. I don't know what that does to streaming in a few weeks. Uh, I might have to take a few days off. Who knows? The surgery is literally all right here. That might affect my ability to, uh, I don't know, do anything for a day or two or a week. I just don't know. Uh, I will know on December 9th when I go in for my prep. Uh, so we will see how that works out and uh, what all that means. I, I will let people know at that point. Um, I'm happy about it, though. I mean, I've had the deviated septum since I was 19. It happened. Uh, I wasn't born with it. I, I got it in a car accident where my nose got smashed against the steering wheel. And then 
the the back of the car in front of me after I flew out of my windshield and my head bounced off of their trunk before I went through their back window. Um, it was quite the accident. But it uh, turned my, my the internal uh, here from a straight line into a wiggle of an S. So, uh, yeah, so that's fun. Um, but after COVID and everything, all the extra damage just made it weird. So surgery, yay. Uh, so we are going to uh, have that in a few weeks and see how that works out. Um, my plan is to stream again this weekend uh, and to start streaming a little more often than the once a week we've done the last three weeks. Uh, I want to get it up to three times a week. Uh, I might stream tomorrow. That depends on uh, if chat wants to watch me rebuild my mail server. Um <laughs> Because that will be my task tomorrow afternoon. Uh, my email server is quite out of date. I've kept the security patches up, but I am, I believe, six versions out of date on my uh, mail in a box uh, software, which kind of runs and manages everything. And um, it requires me to update uh, my uh, Linux install there. Uh, it is Ubuntu and it is um, running uh, 18.04. So I've got to uh, ignore the directions on Mail in a Box, which tell me not to do this. And uh, they tell you to take a backup of all of your data from a mail server with like 10 different pieces of software and calendaring and file serving and next cloud and blah, blah, blah to back all that up. And, um, and then reinstall from scratch Ubuntu 22 uh, and then reinstall Mail in a Box and then, you know, bring all that data back uh, all by hand at the command line. They tell you not to do an in-place update from 18 uh, to 22. Uh, so I'm going to ignore that because someone in one of the forums has stated that, that they were successful by going from 18 to 20 to 22 and then fixing these like 20 like things. Like they listed off like, and this was broke and this was broke, but they listed exactly their commands to fix them too. So I don't have to go fight through logs and find them all. Uh, so I'm just going to try it the uh, way they told me not to. Uh, it's on DigitalOcean, so I get to just do a backup of the server and then, you know, hope and pray that it goes well and I don't have to recover. So, uh, yeah, okay. I mean, I'll, I'll go live while I'm fighting with that tomorrow. Uh, everything's done by private key, so it's not like you're going to watch me type in passwords or anything. Um, you know, uh, so, uh, yeah, cool. Uh, we'll do that tomorrow afternoon together. You guys get to watch probably me fail horribly at it because I hate mail server upgrading. That's why it's so out of date because um, I've run my own mail server now since the 90s. Um, and I've, you know, done a pretty good job of, uh, keeping it all up and running and going and, uh, migrating it to new software and migrating it to new platforms. And, uh, the biggest fight is always keeping your IP address, uh, because that's what has the reputation scores on the spam filters and all, all the whitelisting, which I do have whitelisted in a lot of places. Like my IP address for my mail server, my personal one is whitelisted at Microsoft for all of Outlook and Office 365 and all of that. So like losing that IP address would suck. So I don't like the idea of completely reinstalling from scratch on a new uh, VPS and then like you're know, bringing it in. That's uh, not what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm going to in place upgrade this one. Uh, so we'll do that tomorrow together. You guys can uh, join in on uh, on the horrible uh, not fun uh, that that's going to be. It should be a laugh riot. Uh, yeah, that that is good times. Um, I do have... You know, this is weird. I, I like my midday times. I'm doing a lot of stuff on the computer and I'm wondering if it's things that people want to see like that. Like next week, I've got to do a lot of design work on a website for a client I'm working on. And, um, you know, I, I could just do that while I'm live and we could just all chat while I'm doing it. So I guess we'll have some of those types of streams, too. But uh, yeah, I want to, uh, you know, continue with what we're here for and uh, why we do this and all that fun stuff. Me and Mac talking about all the latest fun stuff. And uh, I think we should start off with uh, maybe something just stupid and kind of like work our way into the um, the uh, heavier stuff, you know, because there's a lot of heavy stuff going on. As usual. So I want to just talk about uh, the easy, stupid stuff to start and then we'll move our way up. Right. OK, everyone. So let's uh, let's start with the small web. Actually, let's do the thing where I hit the buttons over here and they do fun things. Oh, God. Oh, uh, I need my ADHD is killing me. I need to still make the version of the screen where we're both in a camera box <laughs> and my screen's up. I've got to make that ah, scene yes. in OBS. That's a thing I've got to do. 
Right now, it just switches to only me. Mac is there. You can still hear him, but you can only see me. Uh, you know, this, this I want to show you guys because I think some of you might like it. Some of you who have been around a long time. Um, this is called um, Small Web. It's by a company called Kagi, K-A-G-I. And Kagi are actually who I use as my search engine. So um, I, um, Kagi here, uh, I don't use Google anymore. I don't use uh, DuckDuckGo or anything. I freaking love Kagi. Um, there is a hell of a lot more privacy here, but you have to pay for it. So I pay 10 bucks a month for this account. It's got a lot of AI built into it. It's got a lot of other stuff built into it. But let's just do like a safe search. Like I'll search for me. And... Um, Results look similar to a lot of other search engines, but they do a lot of really cool stuff here. Like, if I don't like this domain, I can go over here and I can start to say, you know, things about it. Like, ask questions about this document from uh, from an AI. I can click on this and I can say, block this website from ever showing up again. Lower its placing on results because I don't think it's good. If you ever get a lot of those uh, Stack Overflow clones that are just spam sites, uh, you can just start blocking them all and they never show up again. Um, so you can do a lot of really cool stuff in this search engine and I love it. But they also have a lot of cool extra projects like this one. If you all remember StumbleUpon, where you could just click a button and it would take you to random stuff, this next post button up here just is going to take me to a another post on another blog. And you can just keep going through. And this is um, all kinds of interesting shit from tech stuff to just, you know, general news stuff to artists and photographers posting to random stuff like Laura's Miscellaneous Musings. Uh, they've curated a list of something like 20 plus thousand uh, blog sites. And you'll notice these posts are all from pretty new. Um, you know, here's November 6th. I think two weeks is the oldest post you're ever going to see. So you're just going to get a lot of really curated uh, personal blogs and uh, an old school kind of content, like almost it's the 1990s again. Um, and I absolutely love it. They also have this small YouTube one. And when you click on it, you just get random crazy shit from YouTube that has like 10 views. Um, and you can just go around um, and hit next and just find... All kinds of cool shit. Uh, and I love this because I used to love Stumble Upon. I used to love looking at all the old blogs and everything. Um, and you find a couple just like really cool ones. I've bookmarked a few of these sites uh, that I love. So if you guys liked Stumble Upon and all that type of stuff and you want some of the old web feel again, um, kagi.com slash small web. Um, you, of course, have to be a member of Kagi and all that. But if you search ever, um, I would recommend taking a look at their stuff because I freaking love their stuff. Um yeah, I mean, it's just it's just awesome. I freaking love Kagi. That's the first thing I, I, I wanted to talk about. Um, let's talk about this one. Uh, this one is sad. Uh, Omegle is gone. Um, sad to me because it's another one of those things that's been around for, what, like 14 years here. Like, I mean, it's just it's been around forever. Uh, it is gone because he just can't take uh, the lawsuits from the uh, quote unquote heinous crimes. <laughs> that were randomly committed on the uh, platform, uh, which turned into lawsuits uh, for obvious reasons. Um, most of them are related to bad parenting, uh, I would, you know, like to say. But Omegle is gone. Um, Honestly, so, kind of surprised it lasted this long. As am I, with my uh, faith in humanity at an all-time <laughs> low. Yeah, we've all seen what happens when you allow the public to just post whatever online. I don't know if any of you have been to Omega lately, but um, I have. Uh, I, I found it funny, and um, uh, you would have to switch to the next person probably 50 times before anything of value was seen. Uh, the rest of it was stuff you <laughs> skipped as fast as you could. So I understand it going away. It's just another one of those losses that uh, that I wish wasn't happening here, you know? Yeah. Uh, and here we are with the loss of Omegle. I wonder what is going to replace it. There are a lot of people whose content is, uh, like their big content is based around this. There's like the, uh, the YouTuber, uh, The Do, who uh, goes on with the guitars and plays random songs for people. Uh, what platform is he going to use now? I, I wonder. I mean, aren't some of the uh, Omegle type clones still around? I would guess they are. Uh, that seems like a thing that's going to going to be around for a while. Some of those yeah. clones, uh, we'll have to find them, spread them out there. Then uh, this one's interesting. Um, you know, talking about all that drama we were talking about last week and kind of learning about this. 
This guy's the biggest streamer in the world uh, by far for five straight years, uh, just by sheer numbers of viewers. Um, and you'll notice this headline, XQC has gambled $2.5 billion. And he shared on screen uh, this little screenshot here that shows his uh, panel on stake.com, which is an online gambling casino. Uh, and it's $2.65 billion he has uh, wagered uh, on the platform. Uh, so he got an exclusive contract to uh, to play on that casino for one, and then also to stream it with his non-exclusive contract on kick.com. But he couldn't get the kick.com contract without getting the, uh, the stake.com one because stake owns kick. The idea is that they can use kick.com streaming to drive people to their gambling platform, right? Um, so one of the funny things was his kick.com contract came out a long time ago. No one knew about the, the at stake one. And it, they said it was $100 million. And he kept joking, it's not $100 million, guys. The way he was saying it was like, it was less and you guys are all stupid. But he admitted in this video, actually, no, it was $100 million. But I was saying it wasn't $100 million because I also signed an at stake one at the same time for $175 million. So um, it was actually $275 million. This guy signed to stream on kick.com and also stream gambling uh, for half the time he streams. Uh, that is horrible because like most of his stream is uh, teenagers who should not be getting exposed to this. Yeah, that is uh, just sending bad messages. <laughs> so I also assume I'm just then this is just me assuming I have no proof of this, that their uh, sponsored streamers, their usernames on the platform might get a little higher win percentage uh, to show off, you know. So the way his contract works at stake, though, is he could wager uh, as much as he wants and he keeps the winning and doesn't have to pay the losses. Oh, so wow. um, he's wagered that much of their money. Um, and you could look, he's lost uh, 887,870 bets and he's won 87,979 bets. So about 10% uh, win rate right now. Uh, which is horrible. Of course, for the amount that he's wagered, you know, uh, that's quite a lot of money. Like, he won $2 million on stream yesterday uh, on a $50,000 bet. Um, so, like, and he gets to keep that. Uh, that's This is insanity to me. And kids are watching this. I'm not against gambling as an adult, but I'm against pushing this addictive thing on kids. Um, it, it, this is not a good thing, especially when he's just allowed to wager billions of dollars. With no consequences whatsoever. And, and, and this 2.6 billion is uh, like a year. Like this is what he's wagered in a year. Like that's insanity. Yeah. What the hell? So uh, I, I thought that was just one of those things. Then uh, this, uh, new technology coming out. Uh, I, I don't know if you guys saw this announcement today uh, by Humane, uh, their AI pin. Uh, but you can see it um, right here on the, uh, the guy's uh, hoodie. It's got a battery behind it that's a magnet, so you like put them together, and that's what holds it on the shirt. This thing is connected to T-Mobile and connected to GPT-4 and chat GPT. The camera and mics aren't on unless a little light up at the top here is on. It's called their trust light for privacy. Uh, it is not always on or always listening. It is not always watching. Uh, it does not have a wake word. Uh, you have to touch it to have it start listening to you or touch it and then say something to have it actually um, start using the camera or the microphone. So uh, they have kept some privacy, you know, thoughts in it, but it's still kind of weird watching someone walk around with just the camera just exposed right there at all times. Uh, it's running their own operating system, they say, called Cosmos, so we don't know how hackable it is yet. It has no apps. Uh, instead, they've built this AI routing system that decides on current context where this uh, should be routed, such as uh, in their video here, um, they, they, they talk about it um, where uh, depending on on what you're doing, uh, when you touch the button, it'll decide what its job is. So let's say someone's speaking to you in a foreign language that you don't speak. If you touch the button and the first thing it hears is a foreign language you don't speak, it'll start listening to that and translating it. When the person pauses in their speech, it'll read it back to you in your language. Um, so English, if someone's speaking, say, Spanish at you. And then when it's done saying it, you can tap it again and it'll wait for you to speak in English and then it'll output it in Spanish. 
in this whole uh, experience, you didn't tell it to translate. You didn't hit any special buttons or start an app. It just knew that that's what its task was at that point using the built-in AI. So I do think it's interesting, but I also think we aren't there yet. So I just don't know what the experience is going to be like. One of the interesting pieces of it, though, is let's say you're in an environment where you don't want it using its speakers and reading out your newest text message or your newest email or anything like that. It um, does this. You can see on the hand there, the green laser. You just put your hand in front of it and um, and it'll read out what's happening. Uh, like it'll, it'll project it onto your hand and you can read it. So uh, again, it has no screen. It is still an interesting device. Um, it does have some shortcomings that are going to, uh, to, to, to really bother some people. Like it gets its own phone number and it doesn't currently connect uh, to your phone. Like say your, your Apple iWatch, uh, the, the, the Apple watch would um, connect up to your other phone number, even though it has a unique number too, and it would still share the text messages and phone calls and whatnot. This gets its own. We don't know if there's going to be a companion app yet or not. They, they haven't really stated that. Uh, it would be interesting uh, if it was. I just think this is a neat device. Um, if anyone wants to watch the full, like, 10 and a half minute video, uh, you know, afterward, I'm posting this in the chat there, but I don't think we should watch this whole 10 minute video on stream. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I think it's the next step. It's very uh, Star Trek-y to me. You're just going to have a little thing here that you can tap kind of like they would when they were tapping their devices or anything and talk to and it will use AI to decide whether it needs to go to GPT and get you an answer, whether it needs to search the web and then summarize something with that, whether it needs to go to your email and pull that out of there. One of the coolest features it has though is as contact contacts come in, be it from email or text messages or phone calls, uh, you can tell it to take notes on those people. And one of the examples in this video, is, if you guys go and watch this video, is um, last time he planned a, a, a lunch with someone, uh, they went out for sushi. And afterward, he told it to take a note about the person that, hey, they really like sushi. And that was all he said to the thing, and it remembered it. And then the guy calls him and says they want to go out to lunch. And he says, great, I'll pick something out. Hangs up on the guy. And then asks the device by tapping it and asking where we should go. And it only brought up like local sushi places because it remembered the note from like three months ago about this guy liking sushi. So it is definitely getting to a point where it's almost like that Star Trek-y like communicator device thing that just can be the computer or another person or be looking at a database and kind of figuring it all out on its own. Uh, I think that's really neat, but I, I don't know. I would love to play with one. They're $700. Uh, I cannot afford a $700 device. Um, and I don't think, uh, I've got a big enough following yet, um, to, uh, to get them to send me a free one, <laughs> but we'll see. We'll see. I, I'm definitely going to send the email and ask why the hell not. I'll review it on stream. Let's go. <laughs> uh, but you know, we're, we're, we're going to work on getting the following up, you know? Thanks. So uh, look at all this first time chat. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm going to work on it, man. I'm going to work on getting this, uh, all built out, getting more YouTube and stuff going up. The last few weeks have really been the issue of just, well, you know, multiple doctors as it's a week. That's going to die down because I've been through all of the updates on all of the things they've done. And for the most part, every specialist I've seen has said, no, great, we're done here. Your maintenance is working. Your schedule is fine. I don't need to see you again unless you've got a problem. So my schedule on the app that shows me my schedule of doctor's appointments for uh, for the local medical uh, establishment here, it um, it's running out of dates uh, for me to go see. So shortly here, I will have a lot more time during the day and during the week to actually focus on that stuff. Um, yeah, so we are going to uh, ask them for one of those and see what happens. Uh, I know I'm not getting it, though, but, you know, it'll be fun to ask. Now we're on to some more of the fun stuff here. Um, I love this post. Uh, David Hogg <laughs> just doing the edit of um, of Moms for Liberty uh, here. Um I posted about this too and uh, about how I didn't expect them to lose as much as they did. I would state that while I think it's great that they lost well more than 90% of the, the places they ran uh, a candidate for uh, city council, for school board, for anything they were running for, um, that still does mean they won, I think it was six or eight, it was somewhere around their uh, races, meaning more of them were in office uh, than were 
I, I think it was like six or eight new ones because it was something like 50 total races, I think, that they won. Yeah, so like there are still, yeah, all the incumbents, you know, right. a lot of them stayed in. Um, it is dinner time for me, so I'm also uh, playing with my my uh, plate down here. I, I did think it was really funny that they tried to sell 50 election wins around the entire country and, you know, tens of thousands of districts as a victory for them. Yeah. <laughs> like, surely they had to realize that 50 was not going to sound that impressive given the scale of what they were talking about. Right. Um, yeah, so I just think it's great that they lost that money, but uh, that many, but I do want to make it clear to people that like, that's still not a complete win. These yeah, people no. still have, I think, uh, nearing it's 60 or 70 people in, in different offices and they are still, you know, growing at it and they are funded to the level that they can keep going even at those loss rates and slowly building for a long time. So they still have to be fought, even though this was funny. Yeah, the, the, this was a, a funny failure on their part, but it is uh, nowhere close to a complete defeat, unfortunately. Yeah. So now, uh, for anyone who might be scared about uh, where Tumblr is going, um, you know, for all of you who, uh, you know, still use Tumblr, um, it, uh, you know, uh, is owned by the owner of WordPress, Automatic. And uh, it has been through many hands. It has had valuations as big as $5 billion, and it is now worth somewhere around the order of maybe $5 million. <laughs> it makes nothing. Uh, they are losing money uh, faster than they can handle it. And uh, the people who are working for that division uh, are all getting reassigned. Well, almost all. Like 90% of them are getting reassigned. Um, and... Um, they are, uh, Automatic's being cool about it. They aren't letting everyone go. Instead, they are allowing them to move somewhere else within Automatic to work on one of the other teams. And I do want to point out, I think it's really cool because one of the things they've done is they've told everyone to pick three different groups or divisions you would like to work in, rank them in the order you would like, and then submit that, and we will try our best to get you there. Um, and that's just, that's just kind of a neat way to handle this. Yeah. Um, it does not mean Tumblr is shutting down. It just means they really don't think it has a chance of making money. So they don't want to turn it off. They're going to keep it on. They're just going to the skeleton staff that is going to keep moderation going, is going to keep infrastructure going, but is not going to really try to build much new. And as I understand it from Tumblr users, they like where it is right now. I don't think they need much new. It just works. Uh, we have Tumblr users in this house. Uh, <laughs> And one of them keeps staring at me as I'm making comments about this thing. Uh, they never recovered from the porn exodus, no. But um, they still weren't profitable then, as you can see by all the times they got sold and their valuations kept dropping. <laughs> um, so it is still going to be there. It is just going to have a skeleton crew staff until they can figure out other ways to maybe make it make money. But with everyone who's leaving, um, yeah, uh, I mean... The valuations are just crazy and insane. So it's gone. Uh, you know, it's, it's going to have like, uh, I think they said 20 employees managing things. Uh, yeah, so we can move on to uh, some other fun stuff. Uh, as the title of the stream says, uh, Carl Rove actually said something intelligent today. Um, it's rare. Um, it is. It, it's rare that I agree with anything this man says. Um Carl Rove warns of the worst dumpster fire in history if the GOP nominates Trump. Um, here we are uh, with even Carl Rove seeing the problem. I mean, I am, I am reminded very strongly of uh, Lindsey Graham in 2016 saying, if we dominate Trump, we'll get destroyed and we will deserve it. But uh, yeah, no, he, uh, it may have taken, you know, a few more years, but... Carl Rove finally uh, recognized the writing on the wall there. So that's where we are. We, we are at a point where I was in a thread yesterday. Um, I won't post in it because of some crazy shit, but um, <laughs> in the r slash conservative. Oh, God. Now, that place is a dumpster fire, of course. But the reason I won't respond to me snarky at them is not because I'll get banned from it. It's because like 20 other subreddits that I'm in have auto moderation set up to oh, where yeah. if you post an r slash conservative, even as a comment, even as a comment that gets you banned, 
um, you were automatically banned from these other subreddits just because you posted in there. Well, the, the good news is you don't have to post an r slash conservative to get banned from there, as I can attest, because I was banned from there without ever having posted there or messaged the moderators or had any direct interaction with them whatsoever. <laughs> mm. That was years ago. So the thread I was in was about all of their losses. It was all of the copium, right? Um, as ah, the GOP yes. and the Republicans yes. just failed horribly on, on election night. And it was strange to watch because there was a very strong agreement in, in the entirety of the thread, minus like one guy who wouldn't shut up, that <laughs> they needed to just drop abortion. That cannot be a topic they bring up ever again. Yep. They, they, they cannot st- keep bringing these bills up. They need to just get away from it. It's a lost cause. And um, there was also an understanding in the thread, which was really interesting, that no matter what we do now, the Democrats are just going to keep calling us uh, on our abortion stances. Even if we stop bringing it up from now on, they won't let us stop talking about it. Um, so we're screwed. We're done here. This sucks. Uh, a very defeatist uh, you know, tone in the thread, which I was in love with. I mean, and I wanted to amplify, but I, I'm not posting in there because <laughs> I don't have a sock puppet. I should, but I don't. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't know if you uh, pay, how much attention you regularly pay to r slash conservative. I like to uh, keep an eye on them periodically just because uh, it's usually hilarious. And it is one of the most incredibly heavily censored subreddits. It's amazing. There's just threads where you'll go in and see like there's 800 comments on this thread and you'll <laughs> open the thread and there will be five comments because everything else was removed. Yes. But, um, yes. I have seen I, threads in there I, like I that. I have seen a number of uh, threads over the past several years where uh, something big happens and like immediate the immediate response at r slash conservative is to acknowledge that the thing happened and that it's terrible for Republicans and, you know, all of this and that. And then like the next day, Fox News or whoever puts out their new talking points and suddenly they are all back on the bandwagon. Every last one of them. It, it is uh, impressive to watch this, the turnaround there. It really is. That, that, that place is just a dumpster fire. But oh, yeah. it is fun to watch. Often, yes. So um, something to celebrate today. Uh, Joe Manchin says, will not seek re-election. Mm-hmm. Now, we can celebrate that this uh, horrible person is gone. Um, but I have to wonder... Who could possibly run with any type of a platform that any of us would agree with and actually win that seat? Um, it is is a very tough uh, thing, although I am not convinced that obviously uh, there is a distinct strategic disadvantage to losing any seat held by a uh, Democrat when, you know, that counts for things like speakership and even someone like Joe Manchin will uh, uh, will vote to confirm some judges and things like that. Yeah. But uh, I'm not entirely convinced that it's actually a net loss um, because the presence of people like Joe Manchin in the party um, makes it very difficult for the Democratic Party to convince the public that they have a any message that they actually stand by because – As soon as they hold power, people like Joe Manchin will just make sure that nothing gets done on virtually all of it. So I actually think that um, he may well, his presence in Congress might actually do more harm than good. Right. But do you think another Democrat could take that seat? It is is hard to see how someone would thread that needle. Um, There are certainly plenty of uh, very Republican places where it is possible for a Democrat to win. I mean, Andy, we'll talk about this a bit more later, but um, Andy Bashir, the governor of Kentucky, just won re-election there. Um, Well, it goes the opposite way, too. We keep having um, Republican governors here in Massachusetts. Yes, uh, it, it tends to... It tends to be a little different um, between the... In blue states, you get, like, you, you have uh, voters who are, you know, reliable uh, Democratic voters at certain scales, but they're not usually um, the sort of ideologues that will absolutely refuse to vote for any Republican. 
which I mean, I, I pretty much am. So I, I'm certainly not counting myself among there, but, uh, <laughs> that, that is a distinct thing where they're like, they, they want a lot of Democrats want there to be reasonable Republicans that they can vote for. And then they can be like, look, I'm not a partisan. I'm a centrist. Sure. And if you look at things like one of those uh, Republicans uh, here was Mitt Romney. Right. Who at this point, even though I disagree with almost every stance he has on everything, <laughs> is the closest to a Republican I could ever vote for, I think, right. um, yeah, in yeah. any of these positions. So, yeah, you're not you're not wrong on that. But I, I guess also, uh, you know, in chat there, the the question of what is he doing next? I mean, my assumption is that he leaves the Senate. And then he goes and uh, becomes a fellow at the Heritage, um, you know, foundation there and works for the Republican think tanks. I, I was guessing lobbyist, but... Um, you know, hey, sa same difference, right? <laughs> it's not that different, no. No, no, no. No, <laughs> no that, that, that is what I was assuming, that he was just going to go and really reveal who he actually is. I mean, I was guessing coal lobbyist just because uh, that's sure, sure. kind of his thing, but, you know... There, yep, there yep. Are, there's a few possibilities there. None of them are good. Thank you for the gift sub. Anonymous. The right people to be doing stuff. <laughs> Indeed. So now we have this fun one. Kevin McCarthy. Congress will benefit, quote, tremendously from Matt Gates' ouster. Now, I think a lot of people will, including this article, will think that this is because of what Matt Gates did to McCarthy or all of the other, um, you know, Republicans uh, talking about Matt Gates' ouster, ouster is is because of his work with the Freedom Caucus, and I just don't believe that for a minute. Uh, what I believe is that uh, Matt Gates is one a piece of shit, uh, but two, the only strong Republican who is actually uh, pushing for term limits for a ban on trading stocks uh, by, uh, you know, people in Congress. Uh, all these things that they don't want. So while they're going to use the cover of what he did in the Freedom Caucus and what he did to Kevin McCarthy as why they want him out, uh, I don't for a minute believe that's why they want him out. I think it's because he keeps bringing up these bills. Now, add to that, I don't think he's bringing up these bills because he's a good guy. I mean, he's <laughs> no. not. We know he's not. Uh, you can ask a bunch of underage girls uh, on cocaine, uh, you know, how good of a guy he is and where they got it from. Because, you know, the answer might be him, mm -hmm. um, you know, allegedly. Oh, um, allegedly, according to his Venmo. <laughs> yeah, according to his Venmo. Um, but I just wanted to point out, like, you know, they're going to use the cover of what just happened as a uh, while why they're all mad at him, why they want him gone. But um, or, you know, they're going to use also the cover of the ethics investigation when it's done. Of course. But uh, none of that's why they're doing it. They're doing it because he keeps bringing up the subjects of term limits and of banning their stock trading. Um, that is what I honestly believe. That that does um, seem like a very likely explanation, given that, you know, pretty much uh, anything else you want to talk about that they might kick him. They might talk about kicking him out for is something that you could find another like half dozen or so Republicans in Congress that have done the exact same thing. And um, weirdly, Ooh. not much talk of removing any of them from the Republican Party. So let's go to the next one. Uh, someone else who should be removed from the party. Uh, oh. James Comer. I, I mean, you know, I guess the thing is, uh, really all, I can't say that these people should, like, should be removed from the party because this is just what the Republican Party is now. Uh, this is where they belong. <laughs> the problem is just the Republican Party at this point. Yes. So James Has Comer is going after Biden for the $200,000 he supposedly paid his brother and then his brother paid back. Uh, I say supposedly, but the checks have been made public. Like, he did it. Uh, there's nothing wrong with loaning your brother money and then him being a good enough person to pay it back. Like, that's normal family behavior yeah <clears throat> so um but he's going after him as an ethics problem <clears throat> and as part of impeachment when in actuality he did this exact same thing for more money two hundred and forty thousand uh, dollars with his brother but according to this article he specifically did it um with shady um uh real estate deals with his brother um in 2019 and uh yeah, it was all through shell companies and uh, moving the money around in ways where it was hard to track. Uh, and uh, but but Biden just giving his uh, brother money and getting it paid back is the bad guy. Uh, every time, again, every time they accuse someone of something, they being the Republicans, 
it is actually an admission of their own guilt. Um, it just happens time and time again. It is incredibly consistent. It, or, is, it uh, is just mind-blowing. They are at least projecting some aspect of the accusation, if not if not necessarily literally the exact accusation. There is some element of it that they are just describing what they are doing. Yes, it is uh, quite insane. Now, how about ChatGPT for the last few days? Uh, you know, yeah. having random uh, up and down times, including today <laughs> again. Um, it is a... DDoS, Distributed Denial of Service Attack, uh, done by none other than Anonymous Sudan. <laughs> um, so Anonymous Sudan are claiming that they are DDoSing, and after they've claimed this, OpenAI came out and said, yes, we are getting DDoSed, and that's what the downtime is about. Uh, Anonymous Sudan have said the reason they're doing it uh, is OpenAI's cooperation with the state of Israel, uh, Sam Altman's investments in Israel and uh, AI being used in the development of weapons uh, by intelligence agencies like Mossad. Uh, so it's all, you know, this this veil of, uh, you know, uh, hating uh, the what's going on right now, hating what Israel's been doing to the Palestinians. And that for me is, you know, the right point to be making if only I liked Anonymous Sudan. Um, Anonymous Sudan is, um, well... How do you put this? Because we put out Anonymous when we made all this branding, when we made all these big points, we made all these videos and the calls to action and everything else saying that anyone could be anonymous. Well, this anyone specifically <laughs> right here, Anonymous Sudan, is a Russian uh, APT, assistant uh, you know, uh, threat actor there, uh, persistent threat actor. This is a subgroup of a GRU, uh, you know, state-backed uh, hacking team uh, going under the guise of Anonymous, uh, using our branding uh, to do Russian state attacks. Um, so, you know, I find myself in that weird situation where I can't say they're not Anonymous because that's sort of the <laughs> point. But at the same time, I really wish the Russian government wasn't using the brand. However, I agree with the uh, tax on people who are putting investments in the security infrastructure uh, of the military industrial complex. So... Damn, all of this. Just damn all of it. I'm just going to throw this out there. If someone were to dox the people involved, they would no longer be anonymous. And therefore, would not, well, I'm sure they would continue to claim that they were anonymous <laughs> yes. Sudan. They would no longer be entitled to rightly use the appellation. Yeah. They, yeah. They, they, uh, yeah. All that bashy shit calling itself anon is uh, really disgusting. Those it people is. need to just go away. But at the same time, I, I just have to put this out there. The, the, the thing that, you know, has to be repeated, if Anonymous had been anything other than what it is, uh, it wouldn't exist anymore. Yes. Um, if there was any actual centralized control over the naming, over the brand, if there was any way to verify that Anonymous really did a thing, uh, those would be points of, of attack for the governments. Yeah. And uh, they would have been shut down. you got to remember... Back in 2011, 2012, and 2013, we were at a point of uh, such uh, like fear that NATO put out a, a report calling us one of the biggest threats in the world. <laughs> and then the UN put out a report and, and put together a little council to study the threat and came to the conclusion that anonymous and anonymous tactics were a major problem. So imagine that level of focus. Uh, and Interpol put out a report, too, uh, with basically the same point around that time. And then imagine there being a central place where they could go and attack. Um, you know, it would not have survived those years, especially what happened with Sabu and everything else, if it had been orchestrated in any other way. I think we, we did it right in the beginning. However, it does also lead to this. Yes, that, that is uh, its strength and its weakness is that no one controls it. Yes. So here we are. Um, but yeah, I, I, again, just, you know, want to make it clear that when people see anonymous Sudan, that they know that, uh, that is the Russian government. Um, and while it is a ransomware gang, supposedly those are also run by GRU affiliated hacktivist groups inside of Russia, which are hacktivist only in the name that they are hacktivists for specifically the country they live in, meaning they support Putin. So they are the bad guys. Um, 
so yeah, so that is uh, what is happening with uh, ChatGPT right now. Uh, Anonymous Sudan are randomly taking it down. You also got to wonder, you know, uh, how a group of Anons uh, have the power to take down something that's got $10 billion in funding into its network. Um, again, it's nation state backed. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so that's what's going on there. Um, uh, yeah, so little people will know that, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna grow this place. We're gonna get the viewership up. We're gonna get all this and we're gonna keep saying things like that. And hopefully we can get to the point where people are listening on, on stuff like that. Luckily, uh, Hack Read is getting a decent viewership these days. And, uh, I'm really hoping, uh, people are paying attention there because I do like their coverage of a lot of these topics. And now, uh, something that I had missed earlier, I'd seen the headline go by and not clicked through, uh, but uh, Bueno in chat there uh, posted this on our Discord. Um, mind you, um, everyone should be on the Discord, and thanks to Talking Fipos, we have that command. Look <laughs> at that. It does things. Um, and, uh, and a few others. Uh, so join the Discord if you haven't. But uh, on the Discord in the news channel, this was posted, and... Um, so court rules automakers can record and intercept owner text messages. So here's what's really going on. Uh, Ford, GM, Honda, Toyota, Volkswagen, and General Motors are all using software from this company called Berla Corporation. And it is in their infotainment systems. So when you go into this infotainment system and you plug in your phone, be it even if you're just plugging in to use that as the charging port or whether you're turning on Android Auto or uh, CarPlay from Apple uh, and you are connected into this infotainment system, it downloads all of your text messages and all of your contacts and all of the uh, phone call log and it stores them. It then, when it can connect out, uh, sends this information back to the car companies so they can use it to um, do targeted advertising at you, and then Berla keep it um, so they can give it to the cops. Uh, Berla do not uh, require the cops to enforce warrants to get this data. They just get asked and they hand over your shit. So um, again, if you are driving a Ford, a Honda, Toyota, Volkswagen, and General Motors, and you plug your phone in, um, your call logs and your text messages are uh, handed right over to cops if they want it, are used for targeted advertising. And in the state of Washington, where these class action lawsuits were brought, it was uh, all thrown out uh, on appeals after already being thrown out and then being appealed um, because it doesn't violate their uh, specific law, the Washington Privacy Act, because the plaintiff must prove that his or her business, his or her person, or his or her reputation has been threatened, and the court did not believe that this counted or met that threshold. So um, again, if you're driving any of those cars, um, they are stealing all your shit and sharing it with law enforcement um, and targeted advertising. So have fun with that. Um, yeah, good times. Uh, I'm thinking twice about plugging into any uh, cars at this point because I doubt that's the whole list. Yeah, no, I, I fully expect that that just means that those are all the ones that are dealing with Burla specifically rather than uh, all the ones doing that at all. So I'm going to switch over here to the me and Mac. There we are. Uh, hello, uh, Mac on stream there. Now that I don't have anything else to show on screen. Uh, yeah, just the worst ruling there. And yeah, I, I mean, I assumed it was going bad. I just realized it was that bad, right? Yeah. Um, another first time chatter. Look at the chat go here. Um, this is the first stream where I actually posted to all of my socials, uh, except for Facebook, because I just I don't like logging into that damn thing. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe I'll post there for the next one uh, to hopefully get some more viewers here. But uh, so, Mac, you've got a bunch of topics for us to talk about. I do. Um, so I thought we would uh, start off with something relatively light. I don't know if you uh, or how many of our uh, viewers here have heard about this. Um, Alex Jones. <laughs> never uh, light, never <laughs> light. <laughs> um, so he has, of course, uh, some time ago, he filed for bankruptcy, both for his company, Free Speech Systems, which owns InfoWars, and personally, uh, to try and get out of paying the judgments, various judgments against him for, you know, a billion and a half or so dollars. Um, and so that's been making its way through the federal bankruptcy court. And um, 
the judge in that case uh, has ruled this week that he cannot benefit for bankruptcy protections for a, several of the judgments, uh, which are the vast majority. It's like one, I think $1.2 billion of the judgments. Uh-huh. Um, because his content, his conduct was, uh, quote, um, in Jones's case, the language of the jury instruction confirms that the damages awarded flow from the allegation of intent to harm the plaintiffs, not allegations of recklessness, uh, end quote, because, um, there, there's basically, uh, two different legal standards that can apply here. Um, essentially some types of debts are dischargeable in bankruptcy, um, and that includes debts which are which you owe someone money uh, from a legal judgment due to reckless conduct, but uh, you cannot discharge debts in bankruptcy if it was willful and malicious. And um, because, well, he screwed around and repeatedly violated uh, the um, court orders for discovery and other things until they just were like, you know what? Um, you, you just are not doing any of the things that you're legally required to default judgment. Well, when a default judgment gets issued against you, it's uh, considered that you basically admitted to all of the <laughs> accusations against you, which is um, not great <laughs> from, from the perspective of people trying to get out of debts. Yeah. <laughs> Especially because uh, all the uh, conduct was in fact, incredibly willful and malicious. Uh, the, the judge did, um, say that some of the stuff is going to have to go to hearings, um, because basically, um, the nature of the findings against him, uh, applied whether it was willful and malicious or whether it was reckless and the judgment didn't make a distinction about which one it was. So they have to have a hearing to determine, whether it falls under the willful and malicious standard. Uh, but they've already, they, they already Have they said, ever like watched his show? Everything he does, <laughs> literally everything seriously. he does is willful and malicious. Yeah, no, it's really hard to defend any of his conduct as merely reckless. Uh, <laughs> Welcome back, homie. Thanks for the uh, 22 months resubscribe there. Good times. How's it going? Yeah, uh, and he, of course he's um, trying to claim that he doesn't have $1 million, but... Uh, <laughs> We all know he's just lying and playing games. He he tried to pretend that his company didn't have any money uh, because it owed all these debts. And then it turned out that the company that it owed all those debts to was another company owned by him and his parents. <laughs> uh, that was uh, free speech systems not having any money because it owed all the money to the supplement company that was uh, his company that he they were buying the uh, supplements from to resell. So, you know... <laughs> it is uh, nice to see that the bankruptcy courts are uh, not having any of uh, any of that. And hopefully uh, it won't just be the billion or so that remains um, uh, uh, non-dischargeable for him. But um, I thought I thought everyone would enjoy hearing about that. I know I did. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um. We also, speaking of uh, entertaining court cases, of course, Donald Trump has um, been in court quite a bit. Uh, he has a number of cases going on, and we've seen some developments in more than one of those cases. Um, some of them were more important than others, probably. Uh, I think the probably the only case that we saw any um, meaningful, significant developments in were the New York civil case, um, which, of course, uh, we had already seen Don Jr. and Eric Trump uh, testify in very poorly and just further incriminate. Well, I guess um, whether it's incrimination or merely uh, demonstrating their uh, the guilt of the accusations in this case, uh, I guess you can argue. I, I suspect some of it might well lead to criminal indictments later, so... Indicting might be the correct phrase there, but we will see. But um, regardless, uh, now Donald Trump himself went on the stand and somehow managed to do worse than if he just pleaded the fifth. Because, um, I mean, 
at least, you know, the the worst that happens is uh, in a civil case, if you plead the fifth, is they're allowed to, to make an adverse inference and be like, oh, well, if he had answered the question, what would he have said that he is instead t- pleading the fifth? And uh, usually it means they are incredibly guilty of whatever they're being accused of that they don't want to talk about. Hmm. And he somehow managed to do worse than that. Um, yeah. Because he basically just didn't actually answer any of the questions. Um, he would go on these rambling. Uh, he, he tried to pretend like it was a campaign rally or something, basically, and just talk about how his golf course in Scotland was the greatest golf course in the world or <laughs> whatever. And that sounds like he needs money and he needs people to visit the golf course. Right? Sounds and like sounds like he's having money troubles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, his I lawyer had to apologize to the judge uh, for uh, saying the uh, New York uh, Attorney General's uh, attorney is a Putin stooge. <laughs> I mean, like, that's the level we're playing at right now. Yeah, and, and in fact, uh, there, there was um, multiple exchanges between the judge and in some cases Trump and some cases Trump's lawyers during his testimony. Um like during while he uh, continued to, you know, not actually answer any of the questions and ramble on instead. Uh, at one point, um, the judge asked his attorney, Chris Keyes, quote, can you control your client? End quote. And then he asked, he said, uh, quote, I've asked several times. I've asked the witness several times to answer the question, end quote. And then followed that up with, quote, I don't want editorializing. We'll be here forever and accomplish nothing, end quote. And then finally he threatened, quote, I will excuse him and draw every negative inference that I can, end quote. And uh, eventually Trump um, didn't really uh, behave, but he stopped being quite as egregious about it. But um, he, he just repeatedly throughout this whole thing, uh, even when he wasn't just rambling on about things that were wholly irrelevant, most of what he would say was just like, for example, he he tried at one point to bring up the worthless disclaimer or worthless clause that he he keeps going on about. Yep. But the judge had already ruled in September that that the quote the defendant's reliance on these worthless disclaimers is worthless. End quote. <laughs> so like yep. he's trying to bring up supposed defenses that the judge was like, no, months ago. Well, they also, the uh, Trump's lawyer claimed that the judges have no authority to enforce the 14th Amendment. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The tr- Trump's lawyers have uh, <laughs> been making a lot of claims and um, their connection to reality have, have not been very strong. Mm. Although, uh, if we want, we want to talk about um, think connections to reality, uh, there were a few things where they actually got something out of Trump. And, oh boy, was it not great for him. Um, so at one point, um, the assistant attorney general asked him, quote, did you ever think that the values were off in your statement of financial condition? End quote. Trump replied, yes, on occasion, both high and low, which is not a good admission to be making in a fraud case about you manipulating valuations, uh, especially because part of it is that you said that the value you lowered the valuations when it came to taxes and raised them when it came to getting lending. Uh, so that's that's borderline just outright admitting your your liability. But then in a different point in the con- uh, in the uh, testimony, um, the. New York attorney general lawyer. uh, Oh, also they did clarify specifically that um, one of the uh, valuations, a 2017 statement about the value of his penthouse apartment at Trump tower in Manhattan. um, Trump admitted that it quote unquote, probably came at his discretion Uh, quote. Probably I said, I thought it was too high End quote. Um, So yeah, openly just saying, yeah, I I influenced the valuations, but then to make it worse for himself later in his testimony, the New York uh, attorney general's lawyer um, showed him one of the statements that he submitted to banks and said, um, quote, this says in order to induce lending, you see that Trump? Yes. 
uh, New York Attorney General lawyer. It says, as of June 30th, 2011, do you believe it was true and accurate? Trump. Yeah, I do. So he admitted that he influenced valuations and he admitted that those valuations were provided as part of financial statements to banks intended to induce lending. Those are basically the two elements of fraud. He changed valuations and he did so in order to defraud <laughs> to lenders. Uh, yeah, I, it's, it's literally like as bad for him as testimony could get without outright yep. just like admitting to things that can't be construed as anything other than criminal conduct. This is illegal conduct. It's just uh, maybe, maybe only civil fraud, not criminal fraud. And whether it will end up also being criminal fraud is uh, something that I suspect might well be the case. Indeed. Um, <laughs> Indeed. I mean, he, there are 500 other you know criminal acts. Oh, of so course. They can get him on other things too. And uh, uh, the worst part for him is that you know, the um, there were two parts to the investigation in New York, uh, one carried out by the um, dis- the uh, attorney general's office and one carried out by the prosecutor's office. Uh, and those were one side of it was the civil investigation. The other was the criminal side. And we know that the old prosecutor who left office chose not to make a charging decision uh, to leave it up to the new prosecutor. And then the new prosecutor didn't file charges. But Supposedly, the case is still open. But um, as a result, that means that all of the testimony and evidence uncovered in the civil case can now be used to make a charging decision in the criminal case. So <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> they, might, they might well have gotten themselves in a lot of trouble from the, go, from the things they've said on the stand. <laughs> um, and so I, I do want to, uh, there are a lot of new chatters, uh, and I wanted to say something just, you might all see me yawning and a lot of the people in here already know this. Um, I had a big bout with COVID and a bunch of other stuff over, uh, the last year and a uh, year and a half, I guess. And, uh, I don't get as much oxygen as I used to. Uh, that's part of what the surgery that I mentioned earlier is going to be about. Um, so I start yawning sometimes at like 1 PM and I just yawn throughout the day cause it's just a lack of oxygen thing, and it's going to keep happening. And uh, just so you know, I'm sorry if I trigger any of you to yawn. Uh, you know, is what it is. It's where we're stuck. There we go. So, uh, of course, that is not the only case uh, against Donald Trump. Um, and the there were significantly less important, but... Um, at least equally entertaining developments in... Uh, one of the Jack Smith cases, the case in D.C., being overseen by Judge Tanya Chutkin. Um, so for anyone that doesn't know, Donald Trump has uh, used his usual legal strategy um, in this case, by which I mean try to waste as much of the court's time as humanly possible. One of the ways that they do this is by separating every single thing they want into a different motion to try and like oh, we'd filed a motion about this. And then two days later, we filed a motion about that. And then each of them has to have a separate hearing. They're supposed to be separate responses. It's just an attempt to delay and waste time. Well, the uh, special counsel's office decided that there was a good way to deal with this. And they just took a bunch of the motions and filed an omnibus rebuttal to like all of them at once. So that it was now they basically consolidated all these motions into effectively one. Um, and of course, the prosecutor's statements are going to be biased against the defendant's filings. But uh, even on, even by that standard, just this one is rough. Uh, the introduction of it, um, I think, summarizes it pretty effectively, like a good introduction should. Mm-hmm. Quote. The indictment in this case charges the defendant, then the president, with perpetuating an unprecedented campaign of deceit to attack the very functioning of the federal government to collect, count, and certify votes, to obstruct the January 6th congressional proceeding at which the election results are certified, and to disenfranchise millions of voters, all in a concerted criminal effort to overturn the presidential election results and prevent the lawful transfer of power to a successor. Because the defendant can't mount meritorious challenges to the charges against him, his motions to dismiss the indictment on constitutional and statutory grounds rely instead on distortions and misrepresentations. 
the defendant attempts to rewrite the indictment, claiming that it charges him with wholly innocuous, perhaps even admirable conduct, sharing his opinions about election fraud and seeking election integrity, when in fact it clearly describes the defendant's fraudulent use of knowingly false statements as weapons in furtherance of his criminal plans. The defendant's motions cite cases that, upon examination, undermine his arguments rather than support them, and he improperly challenges the government's anticipated trial evidence at this stage. The defendant also claims he could not have known his actions were criminal because, in the past, others who have questioned, challenged, or protested election results were not prosecuted. But the defendant stands alone in American history for his alleged crimes. No other president has engaged in conspiracy and obstruction to overturn valid election results and illegitimately retain power. The indictment squarely charges the defendant for this conduct, and the defendant's constitutional and statutory challenges to it are meritless. End quote. So, yeah, that was... Um, Beautifully written. <laughs> yeah, and a, an excellent summary of the arguments they make. I, I, I honestly considered going through the entire table of contents because it, it, it is just the table of contents for their rebuttal is pretty brutal. That's just <laughs> but, crazy. Um, yeah, that one was good. And then uh, a, they did file a separate response to a different set of motions the same day about a motion to strike inflammatory allegations from the indictment. Um, basically trying to argue that, well, Trump isn't actually being charged with January 6th, so all the stuff about January 6th is irrelevant and just inflammatory. Um, and their response there was also pretty good. They just, uh, uh, quote, the court should recognize the defendant's motion for what it is, a meritless effort to evade the indictment's clear allegations the defendant is responsible for the events at the Capitol on January 6th. Indeed, that day was the culmination of the defendant's criminal conspiracies to overturn the legitimate results of the presidential election. When the defendant directed a large and angry crowd, one that he had summoned to Washington, D.C., and fueled with knowingly false claims of election fraud, to the Capitol to obstruct the congressional certification proceeding. When his supporters did so, including through violence, the defendant did not try to stop them. Instead, he encouraged them and attempted to leverage their actions by further obstructing the certification. Contrary to the defendant's claims, then, the indictment's allegations related to the actions of the Capitol are relevant and probative evidence of the defendant's conduct and intent, and they are neither prejudicial nor inflammatory. So, yeah, they, they've uh, they've been uh, doing some pretty harsh yeah. responses, and none of it's been wrong. Um, no. I don't usually like to just, you know, cite prosecutors saying the defendants are, are full of it, but... Um, well, I don't normally find myself on the side of prosecutors. <laughs> right? I, I normally hate prosecutors yeah. and everything they stand for and do. So, um, you know, the, it, it is a weird feeling uh, hoping these prosecutors do so well, you know? Yeah, and I mean, it's, it, it seems like it, everything I've seen so far seems to suggest they've been uh, scrupulously above board to ensure that there's no opportunity to uh, appeal later. So, um, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, so, you know, take that with what it, for what it's worth. But it does seem like they're trying to make sure they're doing everything right. <laughs> Yeah, I, I did hear about that in uh, Pennsylvania there. Um, I mean, that sounds like valid mistakes fixed the right way. And then um, and then MAGA just going nuts over it because they believe it was tampering. I mean, it sounds exactly like uh, like what you would expect in that situation. Um, but again, I mean, going back to a point we made last week, uh, you know, I had this really just strange conversation at DEF CON with... Uh, the current CISA, the uh, former CISA, and the head of election security for uh, Estonia and a few other places. Um, but uh, it was it was a crazy conversation where the end result was us all agreeing that the truth of the results does not matter. Whether the machine was right or hacked or whatever, and whatever the machine said doesn't matter. The, uh, the people on the right will always believe the results were wrong if they lost at this point. There's no going back from that. The truth is now irrelevant to them. So um, that is just the world we find ourselves in. Uh, I, I didn't really um, take it on a related uh, to the topic of actual election fraud. We did um, have a case out of Connecticut. I didn't take notes on this one where, but um, a local mayor's race, I think it was, um, they actually did call for, uh, a judge called for a new election um, because someone actually was uh, illegally stuffing ballots in a drop box. Uh, they, they, found evidence of of that happening and it did not match 
the uh, state laws about how people can deliver ballots to drop boxes uh, in the custody of others. They, they have a pretty restrictive one there. And um, so they took it, they found the evidence, they took it to court. And what do you know? They had evidence. So the judge was like, yeah, that is a problem. <laughs> Weird how when you actually have evidence, the courts side with you on those election fraud claims. Well, sticking with the election stuff, uh, you saw today that a letter with fentanyl was sent to Fulton County Elections Office. I had not seen that one. So here's what's interesting about the uh, the news on this one. So uh, it says a letter uh, purportedly laced with fentanyl has been sent to the Fulton County Elections Office, right? So there you go. That's bad. Uh, but here's where the letter uh, says the uh, the interesting part that uh, maybe they shouldn't have said. Officials are reportedly trying to intercept the letter before it arrives. That uh, means huh. they have someone in the group who organized doing this, and they know it's on the way because, you know, they've got someone. So that tells the people who are doing it that one of them is a bad guy. I mean, Or to us, like- a good guy. But, you know... There is always the possibility these people were even stupider than we're giving them credit for. And instead, they called in a threat saying they were going to do that. Sure. I mean, who knows? It's just the way it's worded. It sounds like they've got an insider in this group and they just announced that we have an insider in this group. I Ugh. mean, also, there's there's always also the possibility that uh, they were watching someone for some other reason. And so they managed to... Um, oversee this and decided, hey, it'd be really funny if these guys all got paranoid and went after each other. Yeah, I just found that news right before stream. So uh, Hack All The Things is saying it was sent to five states. Ah. Uh, yeah, so there you go. Uh, okay. Yay. Well, uh, I'm sure we will hear some more about that. So I, I want to show another one that I think is just awesome. I'm going to pull my stream uh, up here on my screen here. So, constitutional lawyer gives speech on drag shows while changing into a dress. <laughs> nice. So, so this story is really interesting because what happened was at West Texas A&M, which has a very devout Christian president, mm-hmm. a group of students were doing uh, a drag show to support the Trevor Project, uh, which, of course, works to prevent uh, suicide for LGBTQ youth. And they had met all of the requirements needed and they had gotten campus space for it. And then the president canceled it, saying outright in the letter where he canceled it that he didn't think he legally had the right to do so, but he was doing it anyways because it offended him. Uh, In response to this, a constitutional lawyer got space uh, and then gave a talk about what's happening with the drag shows in America. And while giving his talk, put on a dress. Uh, and uh, that's just, what a great response. Yeah, that is fantastic. I love it. I love it. That That is how that should have gone, other than the, you know, show getting canceled. Right. But uh, I do think that's just uh, amazing and great. Going back to that one. Let's see if all my buttons work. They do. Look, it's both <laughs> of us. Uh, yeah. So when I look way over there, it's because I'm looking to see what's going out. Um, I'm still getting used to having all these buttons programmed and I do think I need to, uh, reprogram them a little, but, uh, I, I'm, I'm getting used to it. We, we, we will get there. Okay. Uh, what's up next? All right. Uh, I guess, um, so another story, uh, I don't know how many people saw it and it, it, it's a interesting one. It's, it's a, not an entirely new story, but, um, it's, re- it's only now receiving attention. This is out of Louisiana. Um, ProPublica report on this. Um, it bas- basically they uh, fa- they showed pretty conclusively that the Louisiana Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals um, spent more than a decade systematically ignoring uh, petitions by prisoners um, that were filed pro se by themselves without the assistance of an attorney, which of course um, you only have in most states, including Louisiana the right to an attorney before you're convicted. Once you're convicted, you no longer have the right to an attorney, uh, except in some states under some circumstances. For example, in Louisiana, you get uh, access, you you still have uh, the right to an attorney if and only if you are convicted of something that sends you to death row, which um, just to note, the uh, since 1976, 
82% of Louisiana's death sentences have been overturned by appeals judges uh, due to defense attorneys exposing serious violations that occurred at trial. And um, some of those prisoners were exonerated. So, you know, uh, maybe maybe the uh, courts ignoring those pro se petitions from the people not on death row. Not great. And not great. <laughs> yeah. And it turns out that this actually started in 1994. Um, basically, what happened was one of the most important judges in in the circuit, who is a named um, Edward Dufresne Jr. And um, as you might guess from uh, you know senior judge in Louisiana with the name Dufresne and the and Jr. Yes. Uh, he comes from old money there. His family owned a plantation. Um, uh, his nickname was uh, Little Eddie because, you know, that, that his family are those people in, in that area. But um, while he was one of the uh, important judges there, he decided that, you know, most of the judge's time was going to dealing with these pro se petitions. And they concluded that instead of wasting all this time for the judges, this was a waste of their time, according to them, um, and because they would have to have a three judge panel on each of these petitions. And so instead they would let, uh, um, unless they were special or unusual, they would just let him oversee them. And what he would do is say uh, that, well, he, he told him basically his clerk, that he had no intention of giving any relief to any of these people. Uh, so here's some form letters and just pick the bits that are appropriate to the one you respond to and write up an <laughs> opinion and we'll get some judges to sign it. Wow. And this went on um, <laughs> for, well, let's put it this way. The reason that we know about it is because the clerk that, he, that was the one doing it for him uh, in 2007... Uh, I believe it was, um, yeah, to May 2007, he committed suicide at the courthouse um, and uh, put out a letter to a bunch of sources to tell everyone what was going on, including the local, uh, the uh, state's most influential paper, the Times Picayune. And weirdly, no one, despite that, you know, despite all of this, including handing it to the press, they didn't actually uh, do anything. In fact, um, the, there was a uh, event a year or so later where um, the newspaper finally published a story that was related to the this and like mm -hmm. they actually quoted part of his suicide note without any note the notification that like by the way we were, we've been sitting on this for the last like year. <laughs> So were they having trouble verifying any of the information? Were, as far I mean, as we like, can tell, that does not appear to be the case. Uh, and I Was mean, it one of those local small issues where we need to keep access to these people so we don't want to talk shit on them? I mean... Which it, is bad? Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it seems to have been the... Uh, we don't want to uh, draw the ire of the influential local family. See, I have this, this problem where you mentioned Dufresne... <laughs> Mm -hmm. and, yeah, Andy Dufresne, yes. And only thing that comes <laughs> to mind when you mention Dufresne is my favorite comedian, Mitch Hedberg. Oh, yes. yes. You remember the restaurant joke yes. with the Dufresnes. What happened to the Dufresnes? Um, I just, uh, my head went off and I missed like two full sentences <laughs> simply because you said Dufresne. And I just, I was just gone for a second there. I had to, I had to catch back up and, 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 and get back into it there. <laughs> Uh, thanks for the uh, gifts up there, homie. Uh, and yes, Budo, the, uh, buttons are all, um, kind of a synthwave outrun, um, neon style. Um, they're all glowing and bright and, uh, pinks and teals and all that. Uh, cause, uh, that's just, you know, uh, the style that I like. Uh, I mean, everything, uh, around here that I have customized looks exactly like that. Uh, yeah, that, um, hmm. 
I mean, we should totally just do someday just a, a Mitch Hedberg a special watch party, we should. Uh, like a Sunday night or something. He is by far my favorite comedian uh, ever. Uh, and that was a sad loss, although I got to say, uh, knowing his comedy and seeing his interviews, that was probably the way he would have wanted to go. Yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, in a hotel covered in drugs with uh, with a hooker, right? I right. mean, that just that sounds like Mitch Hedberg to me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, that is horrible. And them not talking about it. I mean, it just it it really does look like to me. That thing where you've got to keep access to the local politicians and everything else as local journalists. And if you call them out too strongly, you lose access. And some journalists just work that way. And that's horrible. Yeah. And, uh, as, you know, just to highlight why they might might have uh, overlooked it in St. Charles Parish in Louisiana, where he was from. Of course. There is a Judge Edward Dufresne Parkway, a Dufresne Loop, and an Edward Dufresne <laughs> Community Center with a life-size bronze statue of him. So it might might be one of those things where you look at it and you think it might be hard to take this one down. My life might be in danger. I mean, I, th- I think that might be giving them a bit a bit of credit, but they certainly probably thought their lives might be a little harder if they uh, which is uh, where you find out if someone's actually a journalist or not. Yes. Or just a writer uh, for money. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, yes. Uh, and wow. yeah, they ignored uh, something like five thousand a minimum of five thousand separate petitions from prisoners. Just the way it was all going, I would have assumed that you were talking about like Savannah, Georgia. I mean, you know, Louisiana is very much one of the states I would have expected. Yeah, yeah, totally. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, All right. Um, hmm. So, yeah, that was um, perhaps less fun than some of the other stories tonight, but uh, seemed like a (laughs) worthy addition and a little... (laughs) A little uncomfortable that we're hearing about this, uh, you know, 15 years after the suicide <laughs> note was mailed to that the paper. Is horrendous. And not just that one paper. He 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 sent out to other people as well. But yeah, uh, they, they did not want to talk about that. But um, I guess uh, perhaps um, the next, next stories to cover are um, on the uh, subject of sort of local-ish or state politics um, because we just had a bunch of elections. We did. And um, some interesting things happened in those. The Republicans are upset. (laughs) They are. Oh, I I have some notes on that. They've somehow learned that the abortion issue is a loser for them. I mean, some of them learned that. Some of them Uh, took a little different of a lesson. (laughs) Yes, yes. So... The, I, I think the only state where um, abortion was directly on the ballot this time was Ohio. Yep. And in fact, uh, they passed issue one, a constitutional amendment protecting the right to make and carry out one's own d- reproductive decisions, including but not limited to decisions on contraceptive, contraception, fertility treatment, continuing pregnancy, miscarriage care, and abortion up till fetal viability. Uh, and they didn't even come up with some sort of insane, like, easily manipulated definition of field viability. They were like, nope, the doctor providing the care to the pregnant woman gets to decide. Nice. And, um, of course, Republicans tried to lie about what the amendment entailed. They called it extreme. And then they, when all that looked like it wasn't going to work, they even actually tried to raise the threshold for making uh, constitutional changes from a simple majority of the public to 60% just to, you know, make sure they couldn't do it. And, uh, all of those efforts failed. They are all for uh, democracy in a (laughs) state's rights fashion until the people in that state decide to do something they don't like. Yes. And in this case, that is what happened. It passed 56, uh, almost 57 to 43. Yep. And so um, Ohio House Speaker Jason Stevens said that uh, issue one's approval, quote, is not the end of the conversation, end quote. (laughs) <laughs> and, uh, quote, the legislature has multiple paths that we will continue to explore to protect innocent life, end quote. Did you see the breakdown of the ages of voters? I did not. Uh, there was a chart that showed the basics that it was uh, on the correct side of the vote, uh, mostly people under the age of 40. I'm not uh, surprised. Leaning towards the uh, mid-20s. And on the wrong side of the vote was mostly 60 and 70 year olds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that is, uh, I think, very unsurprising to anyone paying attention to the world. 
Yes, so all the people who can no longer actually have uh, pregnancies or abortions uh, are trying to control all the people who can. Mm-hmm. And on a related uh, note, Ohio Speaker Jason Stevens was not the only one to express a similar sentiment on the topic of, you know, whether they should respect the constitutional amendment the voters just enacted. Um, North Carolina State Representative Brandard, Brandon Brandon Pritchard tweeted out that, quote, direct democracy should not exist, end quote, and, quote, it would be an act of courage to ignore the results of the election and not allow for the murder of Ohio babies, end quote. Uh, thank you, someone that presumably took an oath to defend the, and support the Constitution, um, to say we should just outright ignore the Constitution, um, similarly, Rick Santorum, <laughs> oh, uh, unsurprisingly said, quote, thank goodness that most of the states in this country don't allow you to put everything on the ballot because pure democracies are not the way to run a country, end quote. I don't know. Every time I hear Santorum, I just think of the word frothing. Right. That is that is certainly the first word that always comes to my mind. For people and, who remember, uh, they remember. And for people who don't, uh, Google it if you want. Mm hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Ohio did not just vote on abortion, though. They had another thing on the ballot, uh, aside from, you know, legislative elections. Um, They also voted to legalize recreational weed by almost exactly the same margin that the abortion one passed, uh, 57 to 43. So um, weird to have two good pieces of news about Ohio doing the right thing, but there we are. Um. Yeah, and, very strange. Yeah, uh, that's, unexpected. That, that's not usually how that goes. Maybe our opinions of Ohio are more about uh, our opinions of the Ohio government and less the majority? Hmm. Uh, I mean, we hmm. it, we got to take into consideration that only like a third of eligible voters actually participated in this. So, true, you know. true. I bet there <laughs> no, were no. a lot of people in Columbus voting and a lot less people in Cleveland voting. Is that yeah, what you're saying? Yeah. Uh, that the college kids I mean, all came out to vote? I don't think Columbus or Cleveland were necessarily the ones where the people on the wrong side of the <laughs> issue were failing to turn out. They were small towns that no one outside of Ohio knows the names of. Indeed. Those are the two I remember. Yes, yes. But those probably both were dominated by people. Wait, isn't there that other one, the LeBron one? uh, Akron. There you Uh, go. See, yeah. yeah. See, there you go. See, I know my Ohio. (laughs) I know LeBron, Cleveland, and uh, Columbus. And I only know Columbus because when you lived in Chicago, for some reason, some of the comedians would go to Columbus instead of Chicago and not do both. And if you wanted to see a good stand-up, sometimes you would have to go down there. Interesting. Strange thing. Mm Mm-hmm. Good times. But yeah, um, obviously, Ohio was not the only place to have elections. Um, Virginia didn't directly have abortion on the ballot, but the governor, Glenn Youngkin, had um, very prominently been promoting a ban on basically all abortions after 15 weeks. And that didn't work out so great for the Republicans there as um, the Democrats managed to maintain the majority in the state Senate very slightly. It's 21, 19 to 20, 21 to 19. And um, <laughs> the House of Re- Delegates flipped to a Democratic control. Um, it looks like it will again be about the narrowest margin imaginable. It's at the moment, it's a 51 to 48 margin, but the one remaining race has yet to be called and the Republican leads that one very slightly. So it will very likely end up being 51, 49. But um, Crazy. that does mean the Democrats control both uh, of the houses of the legislature Just there now. Unexpected. Yeah. Uh, I am going to go refill my water. You guys have Mac for a sec. <laughs> and um, I mentioned previously, Andy Bashir in Kentucky also got uh, reelected, uh, 52.5 to 47.5. And again, that was another one where abortion um, was not directly on the ballot, but played a very prominent role in the election. Um, the Republican candidate, Daniel Cameron, was very anti-abortion. On the other hand, um, Mississippi voted to re-elect its Republican governor, Tate Reeves, um, by a fairly narrow margin, about five points. Uh, I guess that's reasonably wide, but given that it's Mississippi, that's uh, pretty narrow. And um, that one's interesting, um, not so much because of the outcome exactly. Um, his opponent was uh, also anti-abortion, so it's not like that had anything to do with abortion. Mississippi is not exactly what you'd consider 
you know, the toss up state. But um, it did. Uh, the interesting part about that was that Mississippi is more in play than usual uh, because they back in 2020 repealed a constitutional provision that had been enacted after Reconstruction back in 1890 uh, to ensure that black people wouldn't get any say in the state's elections. They enacted a requirement that any candidate for statewide office had to not just win a majority statewide, but they actually had to win a majority of the state's uh, 122 House districts. Um, so, of course, you know, they, they were able to, you know, draw district borders and keep the uh, black population contained to few enough districts that they just pretty much couldn't couldn't actually have a meaningful impact on statewide election results. But that finally got uh, repealed, and so uh, now things were actually in play. And, you know, that um, probably doesn't directly impact the results of, of the election, but it's uh, that sort of thing is a voter suppression tactic. It, it makes, you know, voters feel like, oh, I can't have any impact on, on the outcome, so what's the point of participating? Um and so maybe uh, in the future, Mississippi, which has like, I think, 40 percent of the population is black, um, but it has been very, very Republican for a long time. And uh, now we might start to see that become uh, less true. Um, so that might be interesting go going forward. And um, of course, yes, as uh, Homie <laughs> mentioned, uh, <laughs> Moms for Liberty with their... Uh, bragging about 50 getting 50 wins out of thousands and thousands of districts nationwide and who knows how many seats. thanks for all of the subs anonymous that was yes. 10 gifted there uh okay uh as everyone saw while uh while we were going over that topic and all those gifted came through um yeah that uh that alert needs fixing <laughs> it says enter your text not uh mm. what the heck happened um I do not know why it says that. I thought that one was set up correctly. Uh, I, I'm I'm going to ask uh, if uh, Talking Vipos is is around if uh, if he thinks he can try and fix that one because I really thought I set that one up right, but I uh, guess I did not. Um, so maybe a second set of eyes would help. Uh, there are so many pieces to this puzzle. Like I just <laughs> holy crap, the amount of things that have to be set up for this all to happen. I, I, I've I've seen some streamers, and I got to tell you that uh, that I think are absolute morons. Uh, people like Aiden Ross come to mind. Um, just utterly stupid, and all they have like all of this working, and I just don't know how. I I don't know if it's my ADD or whatever, like something in my way. But damn, <laughs> indeed, indeed. <laughs> uh, yeah, good old moms for liberty. Uh, yeah. They need to go. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, that, I mean, you know, you could make it say something funnier than, you know, uh, to enter your text, but uh, I think it's supposed to say the name of the person who got the gifted sub or maybe the name of the person who gifted it and the person who got it. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it, it would seem something like that is what's supposed to happen. Uh, you know, I could, I could be wrong. I mean, you know, the chat might like it funnier this way, but, uh, you know, who knows? I, I, I am kind of a fan of enter, enter your text. <laughs> Oh, but um, yeah. Uh, oh, uh, one other election uh, thing that was um, probably worth mentioning is that one of the exonerated members of the Central Park Five, Yusuf Salam, won a seat on the New York City Council. So uh, good on him. It's vitamin time. Mm -hmm. So um, he, he did. I mean, no, I that's awesome. That that is exactly who we want on council at this point. People yes. like that. Yes, and uh, he's. I um, I did not pull quotes, but the stuff I've I have previously seen him say seemed uh, pretty sensible and like the, someone that should probably be on a city council. Indeed, I don't know if I've ever shown uh, chat this, but uh, a lot of you do know that I have a very bad diet uh, based on a lot of health issues. Uh, where I have to supplement a lot of what most people get uh, when they eat because uh, I don't eat the things that most people eat. And I have like five foods in my diet. Um, but I don't think I've ever actually shown you just how many pills I actually have to take during the day. But um, 
There are uh, 32 of them in uh, this uh, little thing, and this is uh, one day. Um, just to uh, make up for all the stuff I do not get. Um, yeah, good times. <laughs> oh. So, um, I guess... Uh... Uh, yeah. <laughs> I wish I had some more of the, uh, you know, the nootropic ones for like brain function and everything, since for some reason uh, insurance doesn't think my ADHD um, tests are medically necessary, even though like, I mean, you know, when when I got my denial, um, I didn't even remember to tell my doctor that it had been denied. And then my wife had to go into the doctor and she told the doctor who then when she came home said, yeah, the doctor says like, take pictures of that and, 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 and email them to her. And, uh, I mean, there's a system with our local medical thing where you can send them straight to the doctor and all that. But, um, I totally forgot. And like, it's been a week and I just today remembered to do it. Um, and it's just like, no, I need, I need this testing, please. For the love of God, <laughs> help me out here, guys. So now I have to call the insurance company tomorrow and try and convince them, uh, that I need this problem, uh, like fixed, like, badly. But from what I read in the letter, I have to call, I'll be put into this automated system where I plead my case, it gets recorded, and then sent to a review board. I don't actually get to talk to a human. So um, I'm not feeling uh, like this is going to happen. But uh, yeah, denial, 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 denial is what that letter said uh, on every test I was supposed to take. Um, Ugh. But that should have like two more pills in it because of that. Uh, if I was on all the right meds there. Uh, but I am not. Um, what else are we talking about? So um, probably, I guess, um, the big uh, story that we, we should discuss, but that is uh, not a fun one, is oh boy. Uh, talking about what's going on in Gaza and Israel. Of course. As uh, that continues to be... Can you just call it what it is, genocide? Yeah, the same genocidal mess that's been going on. But we have had um, we have had some developments, and some of them are certainly woefully insufficient, but at least positive, slightly. Um, I mean, uh, I guess the, the first one was... Um, one that I found especially interesting was that... U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken held a surprising meeting Monday in the occupied West Bank with Palestinian President uh, Mahmoud Abbas yep. of the PLO, um, which uh, seems very, very uh, unexpected from the U.S. government. That is that is not really how, how the U.S. has approached the situation historically. No. Um, and likewise, uh, he then... Um, the day before, he'd actually met with King Abdullah II of Jordan, um, and in there, in that meeting, he expressed concern about the increasing violence in the West Bank and reiterated support for humanitarian aid to the residents of Gaza. So um, it, it is uh, nice to see some very unexpected and like pro-civilian things from the U.S. government in this conflict, which very much not what we're all accustomed to. Um, no. Uh, and um, we've seen some interesting reporting out of uh, Israel, um, specifically that a number of the families of the hostages currently being held by Hamas have uh, coalesced around supporting um, basically what Hamas has been asking for regarding the hostages, um, a hostage exchange uh, between Israel and Hamas for the Palestinians held in Israeli jails in exchange for the hostages being held. Right, but the, there are 15,000 Palestinians. There sure are. In uh, Israeli, uh, you know, care, <laughs> prisons. Yeah. A whole bunch of which were just grabbed basically off the street for little or no reason. Oh, well, some of them were mad about the settlers taking their land and their houses. Yes. And you, you're not supposed to be mad about that. It, it's better that, uh, you know, what happens because if we didn't, someone else would. Of course. Is so far the only argument I've heard. Um, yeah. Uh, you know. Yeah. And, of course, um, 
Yeah, daily no fire times is definitely helpful. Uh, Egypt having the Rafa crossing kind of sort of open a little a is little. is a little helpful. Uh, I mean, there are some steps, yes. but but they don't make up for the uh, 10 to 11,000 no, dead. Of course not. It, it, it is nowhere near enough, but it, it is... Um, or the posts that keep getting posted by Israeli military, either leaders or just, you know, members on the ground, where they then have to delete them really quickly because they said the quiet thing out loud. Mm-hmm. Like the one on the beach uh, from, you know, earlier that uh, where they posted fr- from the beach saying that they had taken back their ancestral land, including the beaches. Um, which, of course, you know, speaks very much to the actual intent. Yes. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, that reminds me... Um, there's been a bunch in the news recently about the uh, the um, slogan from the river to the sea and about how it's uh, purportedly entirely genocidal, which is it is not really true. It sometimes is. There are certainly groups that use it in a genocidal way. There are also sure. a long history of groups using it in a not genocidal way. Absolutely. But um, the reason I, I I was reminded of it and wanted to uh, say this is because I, I found out recently, um, somehow I hadn't noticed that the actual um, or original election or early election platform of Likud, the Israeli political party of Netanyahu and all of them, uh, in 1977 stated that, quote, between the sea and the Jordan, there will be only Israeli sovereignty. End quote. Yeah. So uh, the the idea that anyone using that kind of language is talking genocide, well, if they are, um, how about Israel? Yeah. But um, again, it is a complicated issue here. Oh, yes. But yes. this also hasn't been going on for weeks. This has been going on for decades. Um, you know, remove the thousands of settlements on Palestinian land. Uh, and maybe we can start talking about uh, the damage done to Israel. Yeah, and um, speaking of uh, the settlements, why exactly was the uh, IDF not available to be defending the uh, Gaza border crossings that, uh, in a way that would have allowed them to, pr- to likely mitigate or entirely prevent these attacks by Hamas? Well, 70% of the IDF was busy protecting and aiding settlers as they tried to steal Palestinian land. And, I mean, it didn't really matter that they had been warned beforehand. Well, no. No, 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 no. no. Look, Benjamin Netanyahu wants attacks pretty much just as much as Hamas. They both want them, and they both want them for basically the same reason, because they think it will help coalesce support behind them and keep them in political power so that they can advance their own interests. Yes, absolutely. It has been a while. Uh, I am doing okay. Uh, a lot of the health issues are passing. I am scheduled for all my doctor's visits. Uh, I'm coming back around to the point where this is going to get more and more often, and I will be here multiple times a week going forward. So uh, things are going well. But right now, uh, heavy topic. I mean, again, the one thing that I will repeat that I did say last week, but I want to just just put it into the group. Like, this is important. They said they had no idea October 7th was coming. Mm-hmm. Egypt said, we told you it was. And the, the fences that they took down to cross over into uh, Israeli land there that Hamas actually broke down and then traveled out of are all uh, border areas where the average response time was uh, 10 to 30 minutes uh, for any action on that for the Israelis to show up. Uh, it took them six hours to get there this time. Um, that makes no sense. And then the thing that really makes no sense and really, really makes no sense is they had no clue this was coming. But then, you know, a week later, um, the uh, the hospital gets uh, bombed uh, and uh, Hamas and them claim it was the Israelis. And the very first messages from the Israelis, including one of their PR people, uh, for the IDF was posted to Twitter and quickly deleted was that they had done it. And then they quickly walked that back and hours later said, no, 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 it was Hamas. And here's audio of Hamas actually planning it. So you mean to tell me that a week ago that much planning was done for, or months of planning for October 7th, and you knew nothing, but a week later you have recordings between the two people who supposedly fired that missile. You have that good of intelligence 
oh, now you, you heard that you the- didn't have a week ago? <laughs> Bullshit. Oh, it, it's even worse because the, you heard their excuse at the time um, where they were uh, about why they didn't know that this was coming was because they'd been monitoring all these, uh, you know, channel communications channels. And, um, well, they didn't see any traffic on them, so they didn't see any messages about this. <laughs> and, like, Israeli in- intelligence is not incompetent. Mossad no. is famously competent. And they, they watched a communication they watch communication channels they've been monitoring for probably years, but at least months. And suddenly all the traffic dies down on it and they don't go, huh, I wonder if they've moved to a different to like communications channel. They just assume they weren't planning anything. What? No, no, that's not a, that's, a, that's really hard to believe. How I always think of Mossad is, you know, what would, what would I care about? And I got to say, I would prefer to live in a world where Russia, China, and let's say North Korea uh, all want me dead actively and are trying to do it than only Mossad wanting to do it. Because Mossad would do it and the others would try and probably fail. Like, I mean, like, <laughs> like that's the level they play at. Uh, and um, yeah, no, they knew. And I... They literally wanted this to happen, I do believe. Netanyahu's people wanted to be able to do this. They wanted to take this land, um, and uh, it needs to be stopped. Yeah, and I mean, um, going back to the mention of the uh, families of the hostages, they're all concerned about the Israeli military actions, too. They're they're, uh, saying things like... um, uh, one of them, the, the mother of one of the hostages, said at a press conference, um, quote, we came with an unequivocal demand that military action takes into account the fate of the hostages and missing and that any move considered will take into the account the well-being of our loved ones. We all heard about the tanks going in and we're all worried, end quote. And another hostage's daughter said, of course, I'm worried that the hostages could be affected by the airstrikes, end quote. Um, and it turns out, yeah. actually, um, a fair, a, a large portion of uh, Israelis pop uh, of Israel's population actually supports the idea of a prisoner exchange. Um, a poll out of Israel showed that forty uh, percent of Jewish Israelis supported it, and um, sixty oh, just over sixty percent of Arab Israelis supported it. Um, so it, it's like at least roughly evenly split, uh, and Israel will not even remotely consider. That they they won't even seriously talk about it. Uh, that the government no. of Israel has no intention of uh, of even considering the idea. Uh, they they have made that abundantly clear. <laughs> and um, we also had some other interesting uh, developments, um, not not entirely directly related, and that didn't really uh, necessarily fix things. But they, they suggested an interesting uh, change of direction from some perhaps unexpected quarters. Um, for example, uh, we heard about a um, leaked uh, memo from uh, in, inside the State Department from their uh, dissent channel that they have specifically to allow people to voice uh, dissenting views. And um, this memo was uh, quite harsh on U.S. policy on the t- on the subject of Israel and Palestine, um, and suge- specifically requested that the U.S. support a ceasefire and that it balance its private and public mes- messaging towards Israel, um, including specifically criticizing publicly Israeli military tactics and treatment of uh, Palestinians that the U.S. has historically uh, not wanted to talk about. Um, That includes uh, things like saying, quote, um, we must publicly criticize Israel's violations of international norms, such as failure to limit offensive operations to legitimate military targets, end quote. And, quote, uh, when Israel supports settler violence and illegal land seizures or employs excessive use of force against Palestinians, we must communicate publicly this goes against our American values so that Israel does not act with impunity, end quote. And these are these are a bunch of you know State Department. Uh, these are U.S. diplomats, uh, mostly lower or mid level, not not so much senior. But these are these are not just people that are um, that have no fam- real familiarity with the topic spouting off. Right. <laughs> these are these are people actually involved in matters of state and international affairs. Looking at this, like, 
oh, there's bad stuff going on there. We should probably acknowledge that. I mean, the state of things at this point are we have one uh, elected uh, nationwide elected uh, or nationwide government, uh, Rashida Tlaib, uh, a Palestinian uh, descendant. And uh, for speaking the truth, uh, she got censured. Yes. Um, so uh, literally the only Palestinian there, or Palestinian descent, uh, Palestinian American, um, speaking up, speaking the truth, gets censured. Um, that's like, that's the level we're playing at right now. Uh, there, there are some interesting things too about that uh, vote to censor, censure her. Um, for one thing, uh, there were... So it was a, the vote was 234 to 188, and that, that obviously is larger, uh, more votes in favor than the number of Republicans in the House. So uh, that means that 22 Democrats voted in favor. And you can probably guess, you could probably guess the list of names if you're familiar with the U.S. House of Representatives. It was mostly Indeed. the uh, conservative Democrats like Jim Coster or Jared Golden or some of the really hardcore Israel partisans like Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Um, yeah. And interestingly, there were four Republicans that voted no. Um, and two of them uh, were uh, Ken Buck, who is announced his intent not to run for reelection um, and has been harshly criticizing the Republican party, which is interesting because uh he, he was definitely on the more radical side of things, and now he's, like, mad at them for being election deniers when... He was radical when he needed to get the votes again. <laughs> yeah. But um, he, uh, Ken Buck said, quote, we should stop this nonsense. We should stop censuring. People are going to have differences of opinion. Sometimes they're going to miss the facts. So be it, end quote. And another Republican, John Duarte of California, gave a similar statement calling the whole thing, a, quote, a waste of time, end quote, and, quote, we can express ourselves and our disagreements through our communications people, end quote. <laughs> That's all the uh, Republicans in the House do at this point is waste time. I mean, look at yeah. uh, them uh, trying to change everyone's uh, salary to a dollar. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's what they're wasting their time on while the government's about to shut down. So. But it, it is uh, nice to, or at least amusing to see a couple of Republicans calling this out for the waste of time that it is. Indeed. But somewhat I ironic that... Uh, <laughs> You know, they're, they're, these people are complaining about wasting time. Um, now, one of the other ones that voted no uh, was Thomas Massey. Interesting. And, uh, of course, Thomas Massey, if you are ac acquainted with him, s predictably said that he opposed it on free speech grounds. Um, I don't know that I believe that. I'm, by which I mean, I would... If, it's hard to believe... Thomas Massey on anything. If people don't know, he's a Kentucky uh, rep. And um, I don't think I've ever believed a word out of his mouth. Yeah. And I certainly don't believe that he's actually in favor of free speech. But <laughs> I do believe that I, that he actually is one of the people that would vote against cens censoring her for all of the wrong reasons. And when I say that, uh, I, I mean that he used the same free speech grounds uh, as his excuse last year. When he was the lone vote in the House opposing a uh, seven-page symbolic resolution calling on the government to, quote, do all it can to protect Jewish individuals and organizations, to combat denials and distortions about the Holocaust, and to defend the rights of all Americans to practice their faith without fear of violence, end quote. That was a 420 to 1 vote. All the members of the squad that people t claim are anti-Semitic, <coughs> they all voted in favor of it. No, Thomas Massey voted against it. Yes. I'd, he also, um, this is uh, perhaps somewhat less conclusive, but um, still seems somewhat telling about where he is in the world. Uh, a while back, he retweeted a uh, meme of uh, a quote I imagine most people have probably run across now and then, um, quote, to learn, over, to learn who rules over you, simply find out what you're not, who you're not allowed to criticize. And it gets misattributed to Voltaire, including in that meme. That was not a quote from Voltaire. That was a uh, <laughs> that was a quote from neo-Nazi and convicted pedophile Kevin Alfred Strom. And I'm not saying that I that Thomas Massey knew that when he retweeted it. He probably didn't because he's an idiot. Yes. But where did he get that meme from? 
uh, that his tells proud you, boy friends. Yeah, that tells you what circles he's running in. Yes, I do not think that he is uh, he is uh, genuinely supporting free speech so much as he's probably not the biggest fan of Jewish people. Yeah, see, you can be for a free Palestine in a two state solution and not be anti-Semitic. Uh, that, that is not a point that Netanyahu and his followers and the Zionists want you to know, and they don't want the world to believe it's true. But uh, you don't have to hate Jewish people to love Palestinian people. You know, it's, it's, it's not uh, zero-sum here. You can want uh, both people to have a place to live and not be attacking each other and not be stealing each other's land. And in fact, um, you know, on that note, uh, if, if you looked at the vote to censor Rashida Tlaib, uh, half the Jewish House Democrats voted against censoring her. So uh, clearly they seem to agree that, uh, or at least the, they are, um, there is not an agreement among uh, Jewish Democrats that uh, <laughs> you can, that, that that sort of thing is unnecessarily anti-Semitic. Well, you all can remember um, some of you who were around for the uh, the last version of uh, this uh, set of streams when I had my good friend uh, Stanley Cohen on, uh, who uh, you might remember is a lawyer who has represented Hamas, its nonprofits, some of its members in U.S. court before, including going all the way back to the 1993 World Trade Center bomber. Um, he has traveled there. He has done his work to support the Palestinian people when he can. And he is a Jewish man. Um, he fully understands uh, the difference between freedom fighting, terrorism, and all the other different intricacies of this. And um, you could go back and watch the episode. Uh, it is up on the Greg Hausch Vods uh, YouTube. And that's the Stanley Cohen one where he talks all about the Palestinian issues, the Israel issues, and... Um, this is, again, coming from a New York Jewish man who is a lawyer who has represented uh, various uh, aspects of Hamas in American court when they have had to be here, such as, again, nonprofit work or um, people who might have left Palestine and done actions outside of it. Uh, under the guise that, you know, in America, everyone uh, deserves uh, good representation, period. That's, you know, part of the founding, uh, you know, culture of this whole country. And... Um, yeah, I would recommend people go back and watch that episode. Although I am highly thinking about uh, letting things play out for another week or so and then inviting him uh, on uh, if, if everyone thinks uh, we would survive uh, not getting banned. <laughs> uh, you know, so I'll, I'll let chat tell me whether they want to have him on to talk about this issue. Um, also, uh, though, on the on the topic, we've, we've seen some other interesting stuff Um out of the U.S. government on the subject of Israel that was uh, not as blindly pro-Israel as we are probably all accustomed to. Um, some of it was not like official stuff, like there was an open letter from U.S. aid w signed by hundreds of officials um, saying that, quote, uh, we believe that further catastrophic loss of human life can only be avoided if the United States government calls for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, the release of Israeli hostages, and the restoration of water, food, fuel, and electricity to the people of Gaza by the state of Israel, end quote. But um, there's been some, there's some interesting moves uh, a little more openly by the U.S. I already mentioned uh, Anthony Blinken meeting with the King of Jordan and going to the, to, um, the West Bank. Yep. But he also um, then uh, in Tel Aviv, after meeting with uh, Israeli officials, um, told uh, said, uh, quote, we need to do more to protect Palestinian civilians. We've been clear that as Israel conducts its campaign to defeat Hamas, how it does so matters. There will be no partners for peace if they're consumed by humanitarian catastrophe and alienated by any perceived indifference to their plight, end quote. That's great language. Uh, too bad they're not doing anything about it and instead of you know, just allowing a uh, genocide to happen. I mean, they, they, I think that there is a, something of a difficult situation there because they, they, there are competing uh, considerations. Um, I mean, they, they do, uh, they, they do consider Israel an ally and, you know, they, they are, um, broadly uh in favor of israel and supportive of 
whatever they perceive as what the what Jewish people want, whether or not that actually reflects majority. Well, again, I'm not against Israel existing. I I agree with uh, that part of it, but the the problem is that. they want Israel there just to continue having the military foothold they have in that country uh, for yes. the region and the intelligence foothold they have in that region. Sure. It, it, it's not because they actually care about the Jewish people having a homeland. The, these people are using that as their foothold. And I, I don't remember which, but I'm sure we could Google it. Uh, one of the British MPs, I believe, a few days ago just outright said uh, we can't allow it to happen because that is our foothold in the region. Right. Uh, I, I, think, um, I think that's their language. They're... It depends on who who in particular we're talking about. There are certainly people for whom it is purely geopolitics. I think there are some people for whom they actually uh, do perceive it as being uh, an ally of Jewish people. Um, and, of course, I'm sure there are people for whom it's a mixture of different factors. But uh, the, the, the thing is, um, the, with... Israel being a U.S. ally and the U.S. wanting to have influence over Israel, they don't want to outright alienate them. So they don't want to... There's a limit on how much pushback I think they're willing to actually do. But there is... I don't think that's... I don't think that's as strong as people want to think it is because of the amount of aid we send in there, both military and just straight cash that... That they wouldn't want to lose. They don't want to lose it, but they don't need it. And in fact, those the the U.S. aid to Israel is more about American domestic politics than it is about geopolitics. Israel is entirely True. capable of defending itself without U.S. support. It, it has quite the military budget even before you account for a U.S. aid. Um, sure. they, they would certainly be in a position to defend themselves effectively without it. And if the U.S. threatened to withhold aid, uh, especially a government like Netanyahu, easily might just be like, all right, well, screw you. True, true. true. I, and I'm not saying that to say that they couldn't do more than they are. I certainly think they could. I just I think that there are competing interests there and that they they feel like they are in a position where they can't necessarily uh, try and force the issue without losing leverage that they do have. And so they're they're trying to um, publicly support Israel, but behind the scenes um, push them to go take things in a bit of a different direction. And we have we have seen some reporting about that. Um, like uh, we we saw um, where was it? I, I had uh, seen something about. A um, yeah, B- Biden officials uh, behind the scenes have been telling the Israelis that they need to change course and stop and pull back, stop the bombing, and engage in you know a more surgical operation. And um, so I-, I do think that they, I don't necessarily agree with them about the limits of what they can do, but I, I do think that they are trying to apply leverage where they believe they can to mitigate things I, I certainly think they should do more i don't want to say per, uh, i don't want to try and excuse it like they they're doing everything they can but i right. do think that they are taking steps that they like they the steps that they perceive are something that they can actually do without uh you know giving up the leverage that they have over the situation <sighs> um so it is um it, it's certainly not where I'd like things to be, but uh, it does seem like it suggests a change of course, or at least um, the beginnings of a change of course in our approach. And I, I really hope that that's the case because the way we've been dealing with the situation for the past several decades is absolutely horrible. Uh, just constantly promoting and ignoring violations of human rights and not actually trying to do anything to protect civilians in any real sense and uh, civilians either palestinian or israeli uh that that is just we've only done things to make it worse much like uh you know how the u.s war on terror only made things worse we created way more terrorists than we ever killed or the war on drugs or any of the other wonderful like how this always goes yes yes and um the, uh, in fact, the, the UN uh, Special Rapporteur on the Occupied Palestinian Territories uh, made a statement related to that in an interview with The uh, Guardian. Um, 
saying, uh, quote, even if it was possible to eradicate Hamas, if they were to er exterminate everyone, everyone, so not just the militants, but anyone who works for Hamas, including service providers, even if that was possible, but Israel's occupation remained in place, all the grievances would continue to grow and another resistance will emerge. It's natural. It's almost a law of physics. History confirms that, end quote. And yeah, that, that, that's straight up uh, just obviously true for anyone yeah. that's paid attention to history, foreign affairs, geopolitics in general, like any topic related to this. It, it's just right. incredibly apparent, but it, it is... Um, always nice to have officials, even ones with no real influence over anything. Well, publicly saying at this point, we have the four hour daily window for uh, humanitarian uh, aid and movement and people to leave and all that fun stuff. Uh, we'll see what that does. Um, yeah, I still don't think anyone's pushing strong enough that Israel's going to stop the genocide. That does not seem likely. Um, and I, I don't see the four hours with three hours of advance notice uh, necessarily doing a huge amount to help since, first of all, they've already destroyed so much of the infrastructure that it's it's not yeah. easy for people to move around in the first place. Second of all, they have a history of telling people to go somewhere and then bombing that spot. So whether people will actually believe them, uh, probably not, at least at first. And then, of course, you know, there's the issues that they're only not bombing certain places and then people don't necessarily, they have the humanitarian corridors, but you know, can people actually use them? Uh, are, are they going to be blocked by rubble from the bombings? Are they going to be right. crowded by the thousands of people trying to get out? Are they going to, uh, you know, get hit by a stray bomb because, well, we How said we weren't going to, we weren't going to bomb the humanitarian corridor. Now that place <laughs> 200 feet away from the humanitarian corridor. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like that ambulance. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I don't, I don't think there's much more to say about that right now. It, it yeah. is currently what it is and we all have our opinions. I think Chad is pretty unified on uh, the same side of this as us. <laughs> Indeed. I, I would um, encourage yeah. uh, people, um, the Daily Beast had an article, um, I'm a Muslim, I don't support Hamas, but thanks for asking. Uh, <laughs> yes. I highly recommend it. It was a great article. That uh, was. I, there was a lot of, th a lot of thoughts that I've had. I, I, I'm, I'm not a Muslim or anything, but uh, nevertheless, I share many of the thoughts that I encountered yes. in that article. Yes. Hello, 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 F Spire, everybody in chat. Uh, you know, another uh, uh, thing today that hit uh, was uh, Waz. Steve Wozniak had a stroke today. Oh, yeah, I, saw, I saw something about that. I, down I in uh, Mexico so City. Uh, looks like he might end up fine. We're not sure. Uh, but uh, we could be losing uh, another member of the Homebrew Computer Club, which kind of gave us a lot of the ideas that became our PCs. Uh, even though he, of course, went the Apple route and everything. Uh, th those early Apples, the 1, the 2, the 2GS, and blah, 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 all the way up through were definitely the first things I got to play around with. Um, so, uh, yeah, so Waz, uh, you know, is, is getting up there in age. Um, I'm sure he can afford the best help possible. So hopefully he makes it through it. It's weird. He's been one of the Rare people at that level uh, that uh, I honestly look at and respect a lot of what he's done over the years, especially when he just outright calls out Apple for things they're doing that he doesn't like. Uh, so, uh, you know, hopefully he pulls through on that one because uh, he's a very interesting character. World needs more interesting characters. Interesting in the not, like, obviously negative way that so many right, of the interesting right, characters right. we have are. Yes, yes. What does uh what does chat want to talk about? Anything that we've uh, missed today? Um, we're two hours in now, so uh, you know we'll be winding down soon. Uh, I'm not completely done, so if chat has other topics they want us to uh, go at, and again for any new, when I look over here, that's me looking over at chat on the other monitor on this side. Uh, my whole setup here is uh, big monitor, and then big vertical monitor, and then another monitor. Uh, 
and then uh, the iMac back there. And then uh, Mac is over there on the MacBook, and uh, all of them are on 10 gig uh, Ethernet now. And it is uh, quite amazing having the local network go that fast. Uh, definitely. Let's see. What's up with the reports of diarrhea-related gastrointestinal cases surging in the UK? I have not. Yeah, uh, I'm not familiar with that one. No, I I've not heard that anyone has any answers for that yet. I, I I heard that you know it was happening, but has anyone come up with any reason? Did something get into the water supply? I mean, I, I yeah and yeah. Maybe, hack maybe all the things says nobody knows yet. Happened. Yeah yeah. So. Um, Good question. We have no idea. Did they all start taking a lot of protein powder lately? <laughs> that stuff will get you, man. That creatine. Mm. I had to. Uh, I had to find one that didn't do that to me. And then I've got. I've got one that I use after my workouts in the morning. Um, you know uh, that, that luckily isn't uh, causing that. Thoughts on the Republican <laughs> debate? You know, my thoughts are that. <laughs> what a clown show. It's all of them showing why the Republicans uh, should just vote for Trump. Like, not that I agree that they should vote for Trump, but none of them are doing anything up there that is, you know, changing any minds, I don't think. You know, um, I, I will say there, there were at least two statements there that I uh, unironically agreed with. Uh, no, three, three statements in that debate that I, I definitely I have no disagreement with. Uh, okay. Two of them were by Vivek, um, and that was not expected. <laughs> uh, he is such a fucking idiot. Yeah, exa see, exactly, uh, Chris. He, yeah. he, I think we are all on that page. But he did promise that he was going to be unhinged, and he was right. I agree. He was going to be unhinged. He did promise. He did, and he followed up. And on a related note, um, he talked about how the Republican Party has uh, become a party of losers. Yeah, yeah. I, so, I have no disagreement on that. So, I mean, you know, my, my question is, since, like, the the name wasn't legally changed, is calling her by her real name, uh, Nimarada, uh, dead naming? No, uh, her, her um, Nikki is actually her birth middle name. Okay, but yeah. And yeah. she's just gone by it basically her whole life. Right, right, childhood. because she doesn't want anyone to know where, you know, her family's actually from. Look, it, you, get a, you get a lot uh, less uh, crap in the South if you don't have that ethnicity. Because Republicans would not uh, vote for a Nimarada, but they might vote for a uh, Nikki. Yes. Uh, yeah, that, I mean... I did like her sparring with Vivek. Yes, the fact that, that was she the just third. <laughs> nothing she said like I, I can never get behind. Like she's she's a horrible person. But I don't know. She did call Vivek scum. And oh, I agree okay, with that. I could get behind that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Her attacks on Vivek I can get behind, <laughs> that's but that's about thing. it. Yeah. You know. Oh, I gotta move around a little. Ooh, I might need to get one of those gamer chairs or something if I'm gonna sit here for hours. <laughs> Gonna have to put that up on the wish list and start, you know, fundraising for a better chair. Maybe I can get one of those uh, companies to, you know, we, we got to get these viewers up to a few thousand a show so I can get one of those companies that has a big logo right here to uh, to give me one. Watch all the other streamers. I think they all have ones from that same company, Secret Something. I can't remember the name of the damn thing. I think they make desks too. I like my desk though. I mean, I've had this desk now for I think 12 years. It is. It has survived like four moves. It is surprising. Yeah. It has survived four moves, and it is an IKEA desk. <laughs> that is not what I was expecting out of it. No. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, if I was forced to vote for any of the current people running uh, on on the uh, Republican side, I would vote for Christie just because he's the only one actively shit talking Trump. Uh, other than DeSantis, but I mean. Yeah, I don't think that really even counts. If I was being forced, I, I would probably be at gunpoint and I'd just say, shoot me. I yeah, am not I'll voting for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's... Uh, whew. That's crazy. They sent surveys. That's... Uh, yeah, I mean... Ugh. Yeah, that's generally how you have to investigate that sort of thing. You encounter uh, un unknown um, 
so cause of a bunch of people getting sick. And you, you have to do these investigations where you follow up with the people like, so where have you been recently? Who you've been around? Done anything unusual? And they have to look for something in common. So uh, that, that is a good first step to try and uh, figure out what the cause is. But yeah, we'll have to wait and see there, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, you know, during the uh, SAG-AFTRA stuff, uh, you know, they, they finally signed. Uh, the, the strike is over as of today. Uh, one of the, um, I mean, things that I've always just wondered is like, I never thought way back when, when she specifically played dumb characters on purpose, that Fran Drescher would ever be like, this boss uh, that she is. Yeah, did not expect. That. Like, I mean, for people who don't know, you know, president of SAG-AFTRA, uh, Fran Drescher, uh, you know, the nanny. <laughs> uh, during these negotiations, uh, right after uh, they were signed, the deal was done and everyone had told the world, Meryl Streep reached out to Fran Drescher and said, great, now run for president. Um <laughs> So uh, Meryl Streep definitely believes in Fran Drescher. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, we do not need any more, uh, you know, Hollywood people uh, running for president, by the way. Also, if we're going to go with a, uh, a, a the head of a union, I, I'm uh, my vote is for the head of the UAW. Yeah, because Sean Fain. Sean Fain. Yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely. Awesome. Definitely. Oh. Right. I mean, uh, I don't know. Uh, it's, uh, I just, uh, I mean, being caught up on all the AI stuff there and that, that being the final straw that they had to work out. The idea is that the studios wanted to pay them once for during a movie to be able to scan all of them so they could do work on the movie without them. And then also they had the right to use that in any future film they wanted uh, as AI, uh, like with no extra payment. I mean, what, what? So you're hiring me once ever. Yeah. And that, that uh, is my career is one thing and then you own me. Yeah, no, that thank is, you. That is what they wanted. Yeah, so uh, not uh, not going to happen. That is not in the final uh, version of this, uh, thank God. Yeah. I have uh, my sag after shirt uh, in the other room there because I was down at the New York protest and I did my marching a little with them. Uh, it, was, it was an interesting group of people there. Uh I did like marching with them in, in, in a kind of protest sort of environment because a lot of times in protests, you'll see the people who show up just to be an extra body and uh, are just kind of there milling around. And uh, at the SAG after one, everyone wanted the camera and um, <laughs> everyone was acting out and everyone was trying to, you know, do the big thing. And uh, I loved that. The environment of everyone, like just uh, everyone wanting to take part in the biggest way they could uh, w w was kind of neat. Whew. Uh, yes, an AI me and Mr. Robot spinoff. <laughs> Let's go. Uh, uh, no, thank you. There are talks about all kinds of fun stuff related uh, to that, but none of them are AI <laughs> Greg in a TV show. Um, I do definitely want to work on another show at some point, and I have some thoughts on some. And I've been talking to a few people about some of them, but uh, I don't know where any of that ends up going. We shall see. Yes, yes. Uh, what else does chat want to talk about before we uh, before we end it here? Ending somewhere near the two and a half hour mark. Tomorrow, uh, probably sometime just after noon, uh, you know, my mornings uh, for all my health related reasons, which, you know, are what they are. I have a lot of working out and exercise I have to do. I mean, literally just to even start to get back to normal. Um, you know, I want to get back to that, that, that version of me that, um, could not do anything for a month for various reasons and then hop on a bike and do 50 miles and not feel it. Uh, that, uh, that's the version I'd like to get back to. I don't think I can get all the way there, but the, uh, comeback trail, uh, starts with, uh, hours of working out in the morning. Uh, my exercising includes, uh, a bike, uh, a rowing machine, uh, a weight bench, uh, standard, like old school calisthenics, you know, jumping jacks, stretching, uh, some very specific stretching routines that are meant to be done before you go and do VR versions of workouts that really work out a lot of your, uh, your tendons and a lot of your muscles that are specific to your wrists, your elbows, your knees, uh, your hips, 
Um, there's a doctor that's done some really cool stuff on YouTube where he said, you know, everyone who gets injured playing VR in a way where they're exercising didn't do these exercises. And so there, he's put out a video that really kind of clears it all up and gets you uh, ready. And I do Beat Saber, Synth Riders, uh, Les Mills Body Workout, uh, all kinds of just working out. So my mornings are taken up by that. So I think the earliest I might stream tomorrow would be like noon, one, somewhere around there. And uh, because uh, Chad asked uh, if I would stream the thing I have to do tomorrow afternoon, which is uh, finally upgrade my mail server before it's so out of date that it becomes a security nightmare because... uh, uh, all the packages on the uh, old version of Ubuntu I'm on now are starting to fall out of uh, long-term support. So it is time to do the major upgrade, which includes multiple release upgrades from 18 to 20 to 22 on software that has told me not to do that. Um, so we're going to see what bugs I run into. Uh, I-, I have been warned by some forum posts that fail to ban stops working, that postfix decides that it's going to fill your log files so quickly with errors if you do it this way that you might run out of space. Um, so there's lots of fun things to deal with. Uh, so I guess I'll stream that because chat said that that would be a thing they'd want to watch me uh, go through uh, that that kind of uh, hell there. <laughs> uh, you know, if it actually works first time and this amount of upgrading on a mail server, uh, I will be surprised. I have never had it go so easy. Um so uh, we will see. Uh, so I think I'm going to do that tomorrow uh, afternoon. You know, expect me sometime noon one, just kind of when I'm done with all the other stuff and I've got some food in me and, and all that fun stuff. Um, oh, well then. Uh, hmm. Hey, chat. Uh, I don't know if any of you are into football, <laughs> but I'm looking over at the big TV that's over there on the wall and there's a bunch of people surrounding a player on the ground all looking scared as hell, and the stretcher is out, and uh, he ain't moving. So I guess that'll be some news for us all to catch up on in a little while. That sucks. Not a fan. Looks like a Virginia player? Damn. Okay. Uh, Virginia versus uh, Louisville there. And it uh, definitely looks like uh, a Virginia player who's down there. I I can't hear it. There's no sound. I've got that muted so I can do the stream. Uh, You all probably do all remember I'm, you know, big sports fan. I watch every sport I possibly can. You know, the second the stream is over, I'm turning the NBA games on. Uh, So, uh, you know, that's who I am. That's that's how it goes here. Uh, All right, chat. Uh, I think we're going to call it here. Um, You can all catch me tomorrow afternoon and watch me go through software update hell and uh, and maybe help me with some Googling during, um, you know, if I get stuck. Uh, We are going to try and figure that one out tomorrow afternoon. Uh, If anyone can't email me who tries for the next, uh, you know, few days or so, (laughs) uh, well, you know why. Uh, anyways, uh, this was, uh, this was great. Uh, you guys can see me tomorrow. Mac will be back next week. Um, I don't know if we'll ever get back to a point where Mac's here multiple days of the week. I think right now for the foreseeable future, it's going to be one day. Uh, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll try and get this so big that, uh, that he has to show up more than, uh, (laughs) more than once a week. Um, you know, uh, yeah, definitely. Um, if tomorrow's stream does not finish the job, I will probably stream the next day too then, uh, doing more. Uh, the other stream, I would guess, is going to be sometime either over the weekend or on Monday when I'm trying to start work on that new website build. Because why not show that stuff on stream and just talk to you guys during the middle of the day? Uh, you know, get the watch hours up and all the other stuff I need to to start to work back towards uh, towards getting the viewership up and getting partnership again. Right now, I've just got, uh, I'm back to affiliate status. Uh, so we need to build that back up. Uh, anyways, uh, thanks for all this. Thanks for all of the subs and the bits and the gifts and the primes and follows and all that tonight. That was awesome. Uh, you know, yeah, co-working stream. Definitely. <laughs> Let's go. All right, everyone. Uh, this has been great. I'm going to do the ending stream button and uh, I will see you all tomorrow and you'll all see Mac next week. Night, everyone. <laughs>